The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Good morning, everybody. Um, we commence with uh, the acknowledgement of country. We wish to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land upon which my colleagues and I are participating in this hearing today. We wish to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And we also pay our respects to all First Nations people who may be in the hearing room or who may be following these proceedings on the live stream. Yes. Commissioners, the first witness today is Diane. Yes. Thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. We appreciate your attendance. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate, he will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. You solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Um, now, your name is known to the Commission, but today we're going to refer to you as Diane. That's right? Yes. Um, and your address is also known to the Royal Commission. Uh, you prepared a statement. Yep. And... Um, for the Commissioner's benefit, that is at hearing bundle A, tab 59. Do you have a copy of that statement with you? Yes, I do. Um, have you read that statement recently? Yes, I have. And are you content that everything in that statement is true? Yes. Um, now, uh, you were employed um, at Afford from 2010 to 2019, is that correct? That's correct. And. Um, can you give a brief overview for the Commission about your qualifications and experience prior to commencing your role at Afford? So prior to commencing with Afford? Yes. So I was in school when I started, before I started with Afford. And as I left school, I began employment with Afford as a casual. And then through my employment with Afford, I gained my certificate for, and then later on completed a diploma in disability and diploma in case management. Um, and um, so Afford was your first job in disability support, that's right? Correct. And um, what was your position description when you first started your employment? I was a disability support worker, as it was known back then, or is now known as a lifestyle assistant. And um, in that job as lifestyle assistant, um, did you commence your employment at the Mount Druitt Day Centre? I commenced my employment at Windsor. Day at program. Windsor. And on what, what year did you move to Mount Druitt? Uh, I, uh, it was 2018. 2018. Beginning of 2018. Um, and the um, Windsor Centre, um, mm -hmm. was that uh, also a day centre? Yes, it was. Um, and all of your experience during your time at Afford has been in day programs? Yes, it has. Yes. Could you um, tell us a little bit about day programs, what's involved in that service provision and where they, they take place? Yep. So they... Are you willing, do you want me to be more specific about Mount Druid, about Windsor, or just overall what a day centre is? Generally what a day okay, centre so is. Okay, so a day program, day centre is where uh, participants living with disabilities will sort of, will come and gather throughout the day. What was typically prior to the NDIS known as, like, would generally operate from nine till three, um, where we had a selection of different programs for participants to choose from. Um, some of them were in the community, some of them were in centre-based, such as centre-based programs might be cooking or sensory or art or music or some different kinds like that. And then some in the community would be bowling, parks, barbecues, different community-based activities. As time's gone on, with the introduction of the NDIS, we've then been able to sort of extend our range of options for participants and times times that we operate to be able to go through weekends, evenings and such. Um, Afford offers a service called Club Afford. Could you tell us a little bit about how that operates? Yep, so that was ran on a Saturday uh, from eight till four typically, depending on the event, we would find different markets or um just general events happening throughout different areas of Sydney um, where we would take participants. Um, they would book in as sort of needed. There would be a calendar sent out. They would select which one, which um, days they would like to attend and we would arrange from there. 
Does that fall within um, clients' NDIS coverage? Where they had the option, yes. So it was it was available to those who had the funding, yes. Uh, and was it possible um, to engage with Club Afford if you didn't have the funding on a user-pays basis? It, there could be um, arrangements made where you fee for service, although it was very uncommon. Um, I'm going to ask you about the staffing arrangements at each of the centres. Um, I'll, I'll ask you to speak generally, but if there are any differences between your time at Windsor and your time, in, and your time at Mount Dora, yeah. please let me know. Um, I want to ask you first about uh, lifestyle assistance. Yeah. Um, what were their duties? So day-to-day -day duties, yes. Again, the, the role sort of changed as time went on. So... Lifestyle, so the lifestyle assistants were generally allocated clients um, where we had different, they would perform under different ratios depending on the client needs. So sometimes they'd be one-on-one, -on -one, some one-to-two, one-to-three. And back in the formation of the NDIS, prior to, prior to the NDIS and we were under ADAC funding, the ratios were a lot greater. So where we might have heard yesterday about the high, very high moderate funding, the ratios attached to those it wasn't really a thing. And if the clients, if if staff called in sick, we would work stretch much thinner under the ADAC system. <clears throat> Whereas now it's, we do need to make sure that we fall within a ratio as much as possible, like fall within the ratio service. Just a couple of things rising about that. You just said, um, heard yesterday, is it right that you were watching the live broadcast? Of Correct, yes, yesterday? I was. Yep. Um, and uh, the second thing is, um, could you just give a rundown of, from the perspective of, a lifestyle assistant starts work of a morning and what their duties are throughout the course of the day? Okay, yep. So typically speaking now, like where lifestyle centres are operating now, they would generally start, if they were to start at eight, there would generally be a transport run that they had to go on first where they would go and pick up participants from their house, then bring them to the centre. Clients would then rearrange into programs, ratios, the correct buses and vehicles for the day or stay on centre and then we would sort of disperse again and commence the day. They would then come back to the centre sometime in the afternoon to be rearranged back into transport runs or to be picked up. You know, there were things like personal care, medications, things like that being done throughout the day in the early afternoons as well um, before they were then handed over to go home for the afternoon. Um, and at, at some point, um, there was introduced a position of senior lifestyle assistant. Is that right? Yeah, 2016, I believe that was. I held that position in at, out at Windsor. Yes. yes. And um, uh, can you just give an overview of what the daily duties are yeah, for a so senior lifestyle assistant? In 2016, that was sort of around the time where the team leader's role was changing and adapting. That, that was, again, around the introduction of the NDIS. So... The idea behind it was is that given the given the team leaders had a higher administrative workload, there was someone there was another sort of tier between the floor staff and the office staff, and that was to be the senior lifestyle system. So the idea was that there would be um, a, a, a more senior person who could concentrate more on general supervision Floor, of the lifestyle yeah. assistants and the clients, right. and that left the team leader. They to could feed back to and management. from us, yeah, as needed. Correct. And that takes us to the team leader. Could you give a brief description of what the team leader's duties were? Day to day. Yes. And we're talking post twenty sixteen. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, our jobs. Where So we had a very heavy financial load to carry in terms of we would do um, service agreement service bookings and we would have to complete um, daily audits of progress notes to ensure correct services were provided to aligned with the like the progress notes aligned with what the services were provided. And then we had to do a daily invoice and then upload that through to PRODA and report on that daily. Um, we had other, that was to be done every day. Every week we had to complete a sales analysis of how, of what was projected to have been claimed per client, what was actually claimed and an explanation for variances. Um, that was done client by client. We also had plan managed invoices. We had um, things such as wage analysis, things as uh, completing pays, doing purchase orders, um, teleconferences, meetings, things like that. 
Um, and um, I'll, I'll flesh some of these matters out in yep. more detail Absolutely. in the course of my questioning. I just want to turn to the more supervisory roles that are mm -hmm. Um Next above a team leader was a district manager, that's correct? Correct. Um, and um, how many um, individual sites did a district manager have management of? That varied time to time. So um, when it was just far west, the district manager had five, I believe it was. But as time went on, I believe that that was dissolved into eight, about eight sites. Um, and in your experience, um, how often did a district manager visit or otherwise interact with the sites that you were working at in Windsor and Mount Druitt? It depended, de that was dependent on who my district manager was. Right. Um, uh, if I can say optimally for the best district managers you worked with, how many times would they visit a, visit a site? Weekly. Yes. And as needed too. Given when I was in Mount Druitt, I might have had a heavier load. Um, therefore, if I was falling behind, it took a phone call. Yes. Um, and um, then above a district manager is a state manager. Do you remember having a lot of interaction with state managers in the course of your time at uh, Mount Druitt? Not a whole lot. Uh, here and there we had prior to, when it, it was the operations manager, this is prior to when it was separated out into accommodation and day program state manager, it used to be one. Um, there would be times where we would see her around critical incidents and site inspections, things like that. And then that was the, um, once that person left, it was dissolved to day programs and accommodation. I believe I may have seen her about three or four times. Um, and um, can I just ask you about other people who worked um, in different positions that afford probably in the head office? Mm -hmm. um, were there any occasions to your memory in which people from the head office visited the sites that you were working at at Windsor and Mount Druitt? Um, not unless there was a reason for it, really. So um, I saw, I, so my site was overflow. We called it overflow to initially start into part of the Cherrywood site. Mm -hmm. Um, the Cherrywood site had a lot of grants and things like that. So we would occasionally see um, the CEO and occasionally a board member here and there where grants were being given. But generally speaking, unless there was a reason for it, not very often. No. Did you understand why it would be relevant for um, either the CEO or board members to visit if there were grants involved in the provision of services? Mm, I, don't, I think it depended who was giving the grant as to whether it was warranted. Um, and um, uh, just at paragraph four and five of your statement, um, you give a description of uh, the way that your job operated during the period that you were a lifestyle assistant at Windsor. Yeah. Can, can you tell us just briefly about the way in which the service operated during that time? So we're talking back, this is around the times of, we're talking about ADAC funding here. We would have provisions in the funding, I guess, where we were able to, we were able to work from eight, from eight a.m. to nine a.m. and three p.m. to four p.m. without have being responsible for another participant. That allowed us time to make sure our paperwork was up to date, to make sure that our our plans were up to date, and that we we're actually having a bit of a genuine understanding. What was sort of known as a key worker role has gotten a bit lost as time's gone on. Um, we were able to be a, have a really in-depth understanding of our participants back then. Um, nowadays, once the NDIS came in, it, it became evident to us that we weren't allowed to pay for staff where money wasn't coming in. So that was the sort of difference where things changed under the, when the funding structure changed, where if we're not billing clients, we can't be paying staff. So the, the, the provision for paid time to commit to administrative tasks went away. After That's that correct, yeah. And that, that went the same for, you know, client-free weeks went for a little while after the, the introduction of the NDIS, but that was sort of more for formal training where, where instead of actually being able to have staff on site and learning client paperwork and key worker responsibilities, having an actual genuine knowledge of their participants rather than just a tick boxing sort of system. And the benefit of a client free week is that you'd, you'd have a paid week where you could get on top of all of the information that pertained yeah. to the clients at the centre 
and, yep. and get a real familiarity with their care needs. And that's on the on the ground level too, not just as a team. Le- like that was for me on a ground level, found it, finding that beneficial. And when not, you say on a ground level, as, like, as a as lifestyle a support, system. Yeah, that's right. As a, as a lifestyle assistant, we actually had pretty genuine understanding of our participants back then. Um, we were able to make sure that the paperwork was up to date. And even every few months, we may, may even switch key workers around so that we were able to have an understanding of an in-depth understanding of a greater number of participants as the year went on. Um, um, now, at paragraph six of your statement, you talk about your relationships with the clients when you were at Windsor. Yeah. Um, could you just um, let us know how and when you communicated with um, the clients and their support persons um, while you were at Windsor? Windsor, what were some of the mechanisms that you used to to give them information and receive information about the clients and their needs? Yep. So to um, so we're talking about things like the communication diary. Yes. Um, handing over. At the start, transport was a, another thing. We, it wasn't offered for a really long time. Um, so we were able to have face to face in you know face to face meetings with a lot of family at handover and things like that. Yeah, communication diaries were there as well. Could you tell the, commun- the, the um, commission a little bit about communication diaries? Yeah, so... Were they also called communication books? Correct, yes, that's right. Um, so each each participant, excuse me, each participant had a diary that was to be filled out each day. They... Um, so we, ba- we just gave a recap of their day, basically. It wasn't anything serious that generally got put into it. I remember once an executive an executive manager once referring it to as the fluffy stuff was what went in there because things that were serious or um, things that had that were serious that could have occurred in that person's um, day was to be done through another channel of communication. Yes. Um, and um, to the extent that there was something serious, how would that be communicated with um, the support people? And that was to be done by phone call or email, you know, where phone call, ideally phone call before the participant got home. If it was a less serious, if it was very serious, it would to be done as soon as the client was safe. Uh, and what? how would um, uh, staff at the centre able to make themselves available to support people so that they could communicate issues with the clients that that you needed to know in order to give them appropriate care. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, how, in what ways were you available to support people so that they could tell you things about the clients that you needed to know? Well, we were to work on site generally as much as we could um, and as much as we could by phone. Um, that was another channel in which the seniors could also get to us. Like they, they were also available to get to us as well. Um, but yeah, as, as often as we could, we would be there, but sometimes we, I had two different premises that I had to operate out of. So I would bounce from one <coughs> to the other. Yeah. Um, um, now, um, in your statement, I think you've already told us that you were mm-hmm. promoted to senior lifestyle assistant in about 2016. Yeah. It was around the formation of the, of that position. Um, that, that position was created at the time. Around that, that time. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And um, then in 2017, you were promoted again to team leader. Correct. And then at the end of 2017 is when you moved to the Mount Druid Centre. Yes, yeah, so I was told by the, I was told at the end of 2017 that I would be moving and I started in January 2018. And that was a bigger centre than the centre at Windsor, is that correct? Correct. And um, how many team leaders were supposed to be assigned to that centre? So when I went there, there was, so there was two when I was transferred. Um, the second team leader was only there for a matter of, couple days before she was moved to another site and I was on my own. All right and um, was um, another team leader appointed in his or her place at any time? Uh, Several months later. All right. Um, Did that person um, remain in the position of team leader? No she didn't. Okay. Um, In the two years that you were at the Mount Druitt Centre could you estimate how many months there was a second team leader assigned to that centre? It would be sitting around the four month, four to five month mark, to the best of my recollection. Um, and um, you then had how many sen- senior lifestyle assistants under you? I had two. Two. Um, I'd, yeah, two the whole time. Yeah. Um, and um, they were to work solely on the floor, though, at that time. Right. It wasn't until after I left that they were allowed administration time throughout the day. 
So that so at that time they were providing on the floor of support so that you could complete administrative tasks, but uh -huh. you weren't receiving any administrative support. No, so yeah, they were to work on the floor five days. Um, and um, just um, moving to the position above team leader, mm -hmm. um, uh, what was the staff turnover um, like um, for the district manager position while you were at the Mount Druid? So how many district managers did yes. I have? To, um, I had three. You had three. Um, and um, uh, we heard yesterday from some of the parents of the clients at Mount Druid that the high turnover of staff made communication in relation to their their son's very difficult. Absolutely. Um, do you think that's a fair criticism? It's, that's a very fair criticism. Um, and um, at uh, paragraph 10 of your statement, you describe some of the challenges that you faced in the course of your role as team leader at Mount Druitt. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, um, oh, sorry. You say that there were between 60 to 90 clients in the centre at Mount yeah, Druitt. Yeah, so it, it varied from time to time. It was a, the same, it was a fluctuating number and, um, and at one time there was up to 100 clients. yeah I do recall in my weekly sales analysis typing a name into the hundreds tab like that's in just column. you were filling out a spreadsheet Excel, of clients it was an Excel it spreadsheet I do remember sitting there going I can't believe I'm typing a triple digit um, name here name next to triple digits now um of the um the clients that were in um the centre um on average, how many would you say would be at the centre on a particular day of the week? That could vary greatly. Um, we had a we had a large operation of people that ran from a community base. We had home care that we were offering, um, and then we had the two centres as well. So, if we're going to say, are you asking specifically about Paul Street? Um, yes, um, that and Paul Street is the site that the Mount Druitt Centre was at when you first commenced as team leader? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so Mount uh, Paul Street could have up to 50 on a, the busiest day, I'd say, 40 to 50 at a busy day, yeah. All right. And um, assuming um, 40 to 50, not all of those clients would be in the centre for the whole of the day. That no, correct? that's correct because uh, we had all, had all these buses that would leave from head office, they'd brown out to the community, come back, we would all recongregate and then split back off again. But there would be periods of the day where the whole of the 40 to 50 clients would be in the centre. Yeah, correct. For small periods, small periods. yes, that's correct, yes. Um, and what number of staff would be required to cover client numbers of 40 to 50? 40 to 50, 25 to 30, 25, 25-ish, I'd say. It very much depended on the kinds of participants we had coming in that day. Some days you could have 10 participants that were one-on-one -on -one, and then other days you'd have a lot of group-based clients where it's separated out a lot more. Yep. Yes. Um, did you have any concerns about the safety of the clients and staff in the centre due to the volume of people that were in the house at various points in time? Yeah, we had, I, we had identified that that site needed to be upgraded for quite some time, even before, while I was at Windsor, that was discussed for quite some time. What were some of the safety concerns you had? Um, well, that it was quite a small, it was a, quite a small house. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of participants that used, used wheelchairs. Um, there was vision impairment. There was such a wide range of disabilities there that if there were something to occur, also there was a really steep incline going in through the um, driveway and we had um, a lot of complaints from neighbours as well in relation to the, the noise and stuff like that there. Did you have any concerns about the quality of services that could be provided to clients when the centres were particularly overcrowded? Yeah it, it was definitely a tricky task to manage um, to try and keep your to keep your quality as high as you possibly could while managing as many people as we did yeah um you know there was also an ever-growing number of participants walking in that door um and um were you happy that there was always sufficient staff to maintain the staff to client ratios provided in clients ndis plans that became difficult on days um the way we would generally work it so we would have a handful of participants that would um for example have one-on-one -on -one booked for 
an outing to do to do something that was important to them where at times we had to in order we in in order to fulfill it correctly and make sure that their plans were fulfilled correctly we would have to ask the participants and the families to delay the service so that we weren't fraudulently claiming but but that service would then be provided to them on a different day a different date correct yes when the, yeah. when the correct ratio could be maintained correct um and um before um, that decision was made, was there any discussion with the clients about the fact that that was what was going to occur? Yes. Yeah, we would have, we would let them know because they would know that they're obviously not getting their staff member for that day. Um, do you remember there being any difficulties with maintaining um, ratios during um, transport? So that was an area that was highlighted um, to us later on in the piece, really, where we realised we were claiming a group base. Um, we had times where we, we had to readjust things where we had participants with epilepsy to adjust to make sure that there were safe ratios provided while on transport. So there were some staff that had to be charged a one-on-one -on -one ratio whilst in that, but purely just for the time that they're in the bus, just to make sure that they, that was what was in, um, the instruction given to us was to charge the person with, the, with epilepsy one-on-one uh, -on -one so that they had their support staff in the event that they were to have a seizure while transporting. Um, and um, we, we heard evidence yesterday from some of the parents um, of Ford's clients that, um, the, that there were issues with the ratios provided in their services agreement being adhered to during transport. Do you remember hearing that evidence? Yes, I do. And, yep. and do you remember also hearing that the time of arrival of the transport buses could be variable and that that caused both inconvenience and distress to the clients and to their Yeah, parents? absolutely. That could, yeah. And you accept that that's a fair criticism? That would be a fair criticism. Um, now, um, shortly before you left um, yep. um, the Mount Druitt Centre, there was a proposed move to a new location. Is that right? Yeah, in Mount Street. Yep. Um, and um, about when did that occur? A matter of weeks, but I, I would, at a guess, I'd say the end of April slash early May of 2019. Um, and um, uh, how, how did the change of location come about? Was it due to any um, any um, agitation on your part, for example. Uh, it had always been, it had always been an issue that we needed. We, it was always identified we needed a new premises. Um, I think the catalyst driving behind, a, like the motivation from people above us, may have been the fact that our vans were taking up a significant amount of parking space, and that they were eager to have their parking spaces back as well, as well as this, as well as us also needing a bigger site. And that the 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 move um, occurred um, in May of 2020. Is that right? I couldn't tell you exactly. You left on yeah, that stage. I was no longer there. Yes. Um, and um, excuse me. There'd been discussions about the location of. The, um, the new centre before you'd left? Yes. Did you have um, any issues with whether uh, yeah, or not so, that was going to be a suitable location? Yeah, so I had gone and done one of the sort of first inspections of it. Um, and in terms of space, like the, the open space of the room was great. Um, however, I think it was a builder or an engineer. I can't exactly recall who it was that was there. Um, the main concern I had about it was that the accessibility of the new place they had mentioned that only one, there was two doors at the front and only one of them was able to be made wheelchair accessible. Um, and that was via a kitchen. And which, um, did that cause you any concerns about, for example, fire risks and that's evacuation? exactly what I'd said, yeah, that it was, a, it was a risk if there were a fire. Did you tell anyone about these concerns? Yeah, I told them on the spot then. Uh, and when you say them, who did you tell? Uh, the builder and from memory, I believe it was my district manager who was there at the time. Do you remember what um, the response of that district manager was? I think it was just because it was in the initial stages. I think it was all just sort of handed to them at that stage, but I don't recall. I'm, from that stage on, it was only a matter of weeks and I was gone. So there was not really very much discussion from that point on about it. Um, so you're not aware of whether or not the concerns you raised were addressed. I've got no idea, no. But, but you know that they moved into that centre. Yes, correct. And the general area, the geographics of that area were dangerous also. There was Could you explain the ways in which they were dangerous? Um, 
so the, the building sort of hidden from a lot of the general public area. I remember having, I recall having a brief conversation with the CEO at the time about um, how eager they were to have the buses offsite. And I recall saying that some of my staff finished shift at 11 p.m. at night and might be five foot tall women. Um, I'm not letting them walk around that particular area at 11 o'clock at night because it's dangerous there. Where, where it was, there was, there was a park there. There was a methadone clinic nearby and there was a Centrelink nearby. It was not, there was a lot of loitering in that area. All right. Um, and um, I, I just want to come back to a little bit more detail now about your daily responsibilities as yep. a team leader. Um, okay. In paragraph 11 of your statement, and you've okay. given some evidence about this before, yeah. is that as more clients started coming to the centre, yeah. your job got bigger and the tasks you had kept piling on. Yeah. Um, um, and then... Um, Was the increase in the tasks that you had solely attributable to be there being new clients, or were there new were there additional duties that were reposed on you well, um, during your time um, as team leader? With every new client, there was you know less vehicle space, less you know less seats on less seats on vans, more staff that were required, more more claims to be made, more resources that were required. So, it didn't just stop at the fact that we had additional paperwork to do for each person. It was just, it was the fact that everything got stretched out a little bit thinner. We had more resources that were required for every participant. And I take it that, that staffing increased as client numbers increased. Yes, correct. But those increases in staff numbers were generally lifestyle assistance. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Um, and um, in paragraph 13 of your statement, um, you say there was a person who was employed by a Ford to seek out new clients and that they got a commission for doing that work? Yeah, that was a customer care manager I believe I believe was the name of the job at the time do, do you know what their commission was calculated on mm, I, I I can't perfectly say from memory it was a percentage of service booking claimed so if the service booking that was made was for $48,000 and we claimed $1,000 a week. I think it was like a percentage of what was claimed, but I can't perfectly testify to that. I'm not exactly sure. Um, and did you um, have a lot of interaction with the customer care managers, for example, in, in dealing with service agreements for new clients or? So they were, so the customer care manager met with the, they, they found the new participant, they went and met with them. Sometimes we would come if we felt, if they'd asked us. Um, they would do this, they would complete the service agreements themselves, the initial ones. Sometimes, so sometimes they would just do six week or eight week ones and then hand them, hand the participants over to us with their pay, onboarding paperwork. All right. And, um, did you have any interactions with the clients prior to them entering into a service agreement about the contents of the service agreement or what their provisions were? what the client needs were and whether they were in the service agreements? At times, yeah, often at times we would. Um, often we would be asked to attend some of the initial intake meetings. Um, sometimes if they were for just smaller smaller services, let's just, as, as an example, a work experience participant who is quite high functioning, lives quite independently, might just want a bit of a Saturday interaction. They were pretty straightforward sort of thing. I might not always be involved with that, but I would go through and read the paperwork and the um, service agreements prior to commencement. Um, you may have seen some evidence yesterday um, of some of the parents of, um, of the clients having issues with the way in which the service agreements were yeah. presented to them yeah. um, and, and being pressured to sign those service yeah. agreements. Do you remember having any interactions with clients about problems that they were having with the service agreements? So the service agreements could be quite complex to some, of the, to some participants and families that don't see them every day like we do I think that, that I think that sometimes that got lost because we were looking at them so often we were looking at those codes and those line items and those things so often that they were like second nature to us and I can still 
I can still rattle off the line item for a one-on-one -on -one ratio off the top of my head now. But they all, they broke the time that it, sorry, let me, re, let me start that sentence again. We weren't able to, I don't think that their families had a clear understanding of how those broke down, breakdowns perfectly worked and that, yeah, they, they were um, trying to finish, sorry. I've lost my train of thought. Sorry, guys. All right. Um, um, is it a fair conclusion between what you're saying about having a fairly mechanical knowledge of yeah. what needs to be in a service agreement and how it relates to, to various items of NDIS funding yeah. is that there might have been a disconnect between a Ford who wanted to set up the agreements in that way and the clients who were looking for that agreement to represent what exactly their what family member was needed yeah. and what that family member was yeah, going that's to a do. Yeah, that's a fair statement um now um, i want to turn to some of the um administrative tasks that you yep. needed to deal with while you were team leader the first thing i wanted to ask you about was the invoicing work that you had to undertake mm -hmm. so um, we're talking referencing ndis specific invoicing i was going to break it down okay, into cool. different kinds All of right, invoicing yep. so could you uh, could you tell the commission first about how it is that invoicing worked with ndis managed clients okay yep so with ndis managed clients um at the beginning of the NDIS, um, a lot of the participants were NDIS managed. So through the once the service agreement was signed, we would go on and make a booking for X amount of money. They were often broken down into 48 weeks um, because we allowed for closures under my manager under while I was a team leader. I think those closures may not have always been happening after I left. Um, so let's just say a participant has a $48,000 um, service agreement that they've signed off for us to fulfill over 48, over the next 48 weeks. Um, I would then go on to their pro, the, the PRODA, search that participant by their NDIS number. We would lock $48,000 out. And at the end of it, at the beginning of every day, we would invoice via a bulk invoice for the day prior. A bulk invoice was done where um, staff were, would do their progress notes at the end of each day and they would attach a line item to the progress notes. I would then go back in the next morning. I would complete an audit of all of those progress notes, make sure the quantities and the line items were correct according to the roster from the previous day. We would then export out of SIMS and into our invoicing system, which was NAV, um, generate an Excel invoice, upload it to the PRODA, and then we would check for rejections at the end of that. Can I just ask you about a few of the acronyms that you've used there? Okay, yeah. um, <laughs> start, starting with PRODA, can you explain what that is? Uh, PRODA is the government um, portal that is used for participants funding to be blocked. So it's be, the NDI, NDIS funding portal, correct, essentially. Yes. Um, and then you, you talked about lifestyle assistance filling in progress notes in yep. SIMS. SIMS is our SIMS? CRM that we use. Uh, that's a, that's a, I'm terrible with acronyms, customer relations client. database. Anyway, client it's, it's a client database. Yeah, yeah that's right. Correct. <laughs> um, and um, uh, it was the responsibility of lifestyle assistance to fill in these progress notes. Yes. What was contained in each individual progress note for a um, client? It was... It's supposed to attribute to the client, to the participants and DIS goals. So um, a lot of the participants have got pretty standard goals, such as um, access to social and recreational activities. So simply by being in attendance, they were fulfilling those goals. So they would have, so that's generally how it was supposed to tie in. Then we would write that they, um, attended, you know, Bob attended this program today, Bob like just wrote a bit of a story about their day and what they had done. If any issues had, had arisen, you would generally make a comment to say, refer to incident report for today. Um, personal care and medication was attended to. Yes, and then that would be matched up with um, with an NDIS line item. And yep. am I right that that would involve there being a line item that had a particular activity and then a particular quantity, which was the time? So spent? there would be a time. So generally speaking, it would be 
typically six hours for a standard day. Um, and yeah, so most, unless told otherwise, unless it was done out of hours or something like that, yep, it was six was the general build amount. And then I think at the end, you said that there was then an export into another system. Correct. What was that system? So NAV was the invoicing or financial keeping system that they had, yeah. All right, and that was maintained by a board? Yes. yes. Um, can I now move on to um, asking about what happened with plan management managed uh, yeah. clients? Okay, so um, at the start of the NDIS, we didn't, we used to use a Word document initially. And then as time went on, um, that became integrated in with our NAV slash financial system as well, where we raised raise an invoice similar to raising a PO through a finance, through our finance system, purchase order, um, where we would again, go through a participant, have their NDIS number, and then go through a code, like fill out the code quantities and then export it out into an invoice, email the plan manager. All right. Um, so that didn't go to the client, it went to the client's plan manager. Plan manager, yes. yes. Um, and um, then uh, were there any self-managed clients at Afford? Not that I can recall. Right. Um, and um, then can I also ask about invoices for programming and what that involved? So uh, client activity fees. Yes. Um, so this was a bit of an ever-changing thing as time, like with us. So the way some participants work, such as um, Lily, was a Centipay participant where they had an automatic deduction that was automatically transferred to a Ford. That was to cover for things that weren't covered by the NCIS, such as the facilitators for music programs, or if we had massage therapists or things like that come in, we would try and break that down into a fee um, that would, where the, where the participant had chosen that program, there would be a fee allocated to that. Yes. Um, where possible, we had grants um, applied for and obtained to lower the cost of facilitated programs. As an example, Nordoff Robbins would attend every Monday and we had a grant that covered their bill for about, oh, as, as long as I was there, their bill was covered. It was just coming up to its expiry date as I was leaving. And then that was being reapplied for. Um, and, um, and, uh, to the extent that um, the plans were either prepaid or postpaid, how was that accounted for? Um, so for the Senate pay participants, that was an automatic thing. That was they would automatically deduct that out of out of their plans and yes. um, out of their DSPs, and that would come into our account. Um, some participants would choose to be pay. Some participants would choose to pay in cash on the day. And uh, if that happened, did they get any form of receipt to account for what? they'd paid? There was a receipt book on the day, but not very many participants chose to pay by cash. And then there were some participants, we had a letterbox um, because I wasn't always there because I had the multiple sites. Um, we had a letterbox on the wall, a locked letterbox where participants could drop money into as well. And otherwise invoices could be given if the, they hadn't been They were just handwritten receipt books. So right. it was not a, um, it wasn't like from our finance department as an acknowledgement of, of it being received. And um, so for an example of if a, if a participant were to be pay, I don't know how they would receive a receipt because I can't. Do you ever... know how that income was ultimately accounted for in a board system? You could see it coming off their bills, but um, there was never a receipt sort of given when it went from participant direct to the finance department. Um, there was never some any acknowledgement of of it being received. All right. Um, uh, just turning back to um, NDIS plan clients, um, how were they able to access the amounts that were charged to the NDIS for their services? Yeah. So that um, that could have been done through their own um, MyGov portals, where they're able to go in. It looks something like a pie chart type of thing where you can see. Um, all of their NDIS funding, it looks, and then you can see Afford has blocked this much, LWB's blocked this much, and so on and so forth. And you can see what's been blocked and what's available. And then as it's claimed, you can see it changing another color as it goes. And plan managed clients could get that information from their plan manager. From their plan manager. Um, and um, uh, 
once um, progress note entries had been <coughs> completed by the um, the lifestyle assistants, yep. um, was it possible to amend those entries once they had been posted? Yes, it was. Um, and um, was there ever any occasion on which you would do that? There would be times where I'd have to make sure that the correct line item, the correct hours of service, things like that were were amended, yes. Uh, and that was, a, that was a part of your job was to run through, check all of the entries that had been yeah. made. Otherwise, otherwise they could and very well would have been charged incorrectly, yes. Um, and um, just just on the amount of time it took to run through those entries, roughly how many entries would there be for a day if it was a fine allocation of... Because of I was invoicing people. both centres at one time, it could be 50, 60 of them. And then the other thing was, sorry, I'm sort of skipping That's fine. something. Something's just come to my brain here that if they were charged transport through their NDIS packages as well through a line item code, we would have a progress note just for transport. Then we'd have a progress note for their day program. And as an example, let's just say they got home and we performed personal care to get them ready for the evening. There would be another progress note for that. So sometimes participants could have four progress notes just for one person each day. So there were times where we were importing say a hundred lines from Sims into NAV. Um, did you um, ever receive any complaints from, from support people for clients that the entries in either their invoices or their NDIS um, plan charges were inconsistent or confusing or were different to the services that they were expecting? It, their, it was um, definitely confusing. That's a very warranted. Uh, it took me many, many months to get my own head around it. That was my job. I was paid to do that. Do you remember hearing complaints about it from any of the support people of the clients at the centre? Yeah, it was, it was, you're talking in coats, literally, like to try and determine, trying to explain these things. You're literally talking in coats for them to understand and breaking down, trying to break down to them exactly what cost is attached to which service. It, did you ever receive any complaints from um, support persons that they were being charged for services that exceeded their plan allocation? Yeah, that, that could happen at times whilst we were trying to apply for application for reviews or things like that, that would occur, yes. Um, just, so, just so I'm clear on that, an application would be made to the NDIS for a review of a plan, but the services would be provided in accordance with whatever the application was so that they would exceed the current plan. Sometimes we were advised that that was what was to happen as a as a result of an incident that was a, that would occur. We would sometimes be told that that person must be one on one if they want to continue support. Yep. So that so that there would be a lag time between when the NDIS would sign off on there being one on one support. Yeah, it was, um, and uh, the need to actually provide that service. Yep. Um, and uh, to your knowledge, when that occurred, um, do you remember um, whether or not? the NDIS would meet that shortfall or would it have would it end up being funded by the individual client and their support people? No, we would try uh, as best as we could to try and beat that lag, you know, and, and apply for the additional funding. Sometimes it, we, we were advised by our um, executive manager of, like, of the NDIS department that sometimes that was used as, as, as proof or evidence of what was required for the rest of their plan. So it was not encouraged, but it was told that this is what's required, so this is what you should do. We would at times have to get our own, if it was if we were starting to sort of shortfall and get panicked from it, we would try and get our own allied health teams involved as much as possible. Um, but yes, that's... Um, um, can I turn now to um, some of the other finance related tasks that yep. you were required to undertake? Um, yep. uh, can you describe what other accounting type tasks um, that you um, were expected to undertake um, uh, while you were team leader at Mount Druitt? Yeah. Um, um, at paragraph 21, you give a rundown of them. The first one um, mm -hmm. is, sorry, at paragraph 24. Um, the first one is wage analysis. Yeah. Can you describe what that involves? Yeah, that took most of the day. Um, that was a spreadsheet where we had to go through each participant that had attended the previous week before. We would complete the claims for the week, for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, on the Monday morning, we would submit those figures to finance. Um, they would come back at us with a sheet of what had been, what had been raised through our finance system or NAV. 
Um, and then we had to record that in a spreadsheet. Um, that spreadsheet had a projected amount of what was expected to have been claimed for the previous week. And then what was actually claimed was emailed to us by our finance department. So we would input those numbers and then we had to explain if or why there was a variance, what it was um, and why it might have occurred. Um, and then let's just say as an example, we worked on an accrual basis of finance as well. So if there was a participant who had a lapsed NDIS plan, was currently in review, the payments would no longer go through. So we had to keep tally of how much that participant owed us. And so, and or if we were waiting for a signed service agreement would be another one. Um, we had to say how much that participant owed us, um, what and what we were doing about that to try and actively seek out getting that signature on the paper, or what we were doing about trying to get the review, about where we're up to with the review. And how often did you have to prepare the wage analysis document? Oh, sorry, wage analysis. I'm sorry, I'm saying weekly sales here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm um, so, so no. We, no, that's fine. So um, the, the sales analysis, um, how often did you have to um, uh, produce that document? Weekly. Weekly. And um, uh, was that presented at any meeting or? Yes, every Tuesday, 12 p.m. Um, there was a week. Uh, weekly sales conference call and um and the wage analysis being a different document what was involved yep. in that so that was just a um our staff the wage analysis was um based on our budgets we were had a projected amount of where they're expecting us to sort of grow over the next 12 months based on our previous 12 months so there was always a projected amount that they were expecting us to spend on staff each fortnight um at once the pays had been pro, once we'd pay, processed our staff timesheets, um, we would get sent a um, spreadsheet. Uh, we would be told how much we had spent on staff for the previous fortnight and what we were projected to have spent, and if there was a variance, why that variance was there. Um, and how frequently did you have to prepare the wage analysis? Fortnightly. As um, and, and with whom did you meet about the? Wage that was analysis? the same. Our district had a we had a fortnightly fortnightly telecom. Meeting. Um, and uh, then did you have to prepare profit and loss statements? Yes, we did. Um, and with what frequency did you have to prepare those? That was, that was, so we didn't, the pre, they were sent to us every month and we had to report on every, any variance that had occurred. So we would have a profit, a p and would be sent monthly. And then we had to report on each variance in our monthly report, which would then go through, um, which would sometimes take us to, breaking down and going through and investigating our general ledgers. Um, when you commenced as um, team leader, did you feel like you had um, sufficient um, training or qualifications to complete financial documents of Not the of this calibre, no. Not um, of this calibre. What assistance did you get from Afford in being able to complete those documents correctly? Well, initially we had the assistance of um, what was known as an opt accountant, um, was one of the positions that we had who could help us break down these sorts of things and help us dig through our ledgers and things like that. But that, that position was made redundant. Um, but uh, generally speaking, um, we had our district managers teaching us, teaching us the ins and outs of this at the start. Yep. Um, um, taking together the financial documents that you've just told us about as yep. well as the invoicing. Um, can you give us a rough estimate of how much of a standard day was taken up with finance and administrative tasks when you were team leader at Mount Druitt? Uh, finance and administrative tasks? Yes. Oh, 100% of it pretty much. There was very, very little time to walk away from, walk away from the computer, very, very little. Um, and that's not including the time that was volunteered at home. Um, when you say volunteered at home, why would you need to complete any of that work at home? Because we weren't able to get it done eight till four, Monday to Friday. Um, uh, do you um, feel that the finance and administrative aspects of your job uh, affected um, your oversight of the clients and the staff at the centre and the work that they were doing? Absolutely. Um, do you feel like that then created any risks to the clients? Yes. Can you elaborate on on well for starters there was the issues you think that that created well for starters there was a rapid growth in this in this particular program that we we were growing constantly you know 
we were asking, I, I, there were times where I asked for intake to be capped or restricted or to a monetary or a number value each, each month. Um, there was, I remember a time when I believe it was a Northcott in the area had closed down and there was just client after client after client who was just trying to, trying to get through the doors. Um, it was a risk. Um, it, we in weren't a able to world. catch it. Sorry, I've please I said, finished. I said we, we weren't it. able to catch every issue coming through that door because it was just growing too quick. It was dangerous. Um, in a perfect world, um, how much time would it, a team leader to have available to them to make sure that that what was happening on the floor of, of, of Afford and out at the activities that Afford clients were um, undertaking was properly supervised? and By myself? Yes. There wouldn't have been a whole heap of time where I was able to do it. I was there, so I could have I could hear things happening if I needed to go out or if something had happened. But I also had there was also while I was at one site, there was another site completely unwatched. And so you can automatically say that 50% of the time I wasn't watching one of my sites. And then while I was there, there was such that like our, our claims were due by 12 p.m. every day. So we had to go through and do all that that finance house before tasks before 12 p.m every day so that you basically walked in the door and you beelined it straight into that office to start auditing your progress notes it, there was a whole heap of other administrative tasks i we needed we we weren't able to catch those to be able to see those flaws as often as what we needed to um uh Just turning back to the work that you um, were undertaking outside of hours at home, mm -hmm. um, were you paid overtime for those hours? No. Um, just turning briefly to the senior lifestyle assistance and the lifestyle assistance, you've, you've told us that the lifestyle assistance completed at least the first cut of the progress notes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, did they have time allocated to them in their day to complete that work? There was always about trying to improve the system. There was always, we were always trying to improve the, you know, the systems that could allow us to have sims running on um, phones, on site phones or things like that, where they were able to do it. We had staff where transport runs, there might be a lapse of time between where we were able to temporarily hand clients over for periods of time, but there wasn't a complete like slot to say there wasn't a slot of time where we say here here's half an hour of every day where you have no participants and no and and your only responsibility is to do your progress notes that wasn't something that was given to everyone so what would the lifestyle assistant do in that circumstance well they would try so let's as an example sometimes transport runs might get back to the site at quarter to four they would use that 15 minutes to try and do it or if there was uh, a participant that was picked up at two o'clock, as an example, we had an hour to where that where we could try and rotate staff around to try and get into the offices. Is what you're saying that that what ended up happening was that there was a juggling of staff to try and continue to maintain yep. staff to client ratios whilst giving some of the staff an opportunity to com complete their administrative yep, tasks. Yeah, there was. A, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, You've already spoken about the impact of your administrative burden on, on oversight of what was happening at the centres. Yep. What about communication with support persons during the time that you were team leader? Do you feel like that impacted on your ability to communicate with them about what was happening yeah, with the clients? Hugely. We, I would have loved to have been able to do more of that. Um, uh, what did you do to try and maintain communications with clients over that period? We would try as much as possible to, you know, do group texts or not group, but like in text message at chains or things like that where, or emails as much as possible, but it was quite difficult to try and upkeep with that many, that many participants. If, if I had allotted every family an hour of my month, it would have been more than 50% of my working, you know, my working hours would have been just and that's just given if they were able to walk in one after the other and no laps in between. Um, um, yeah. The learning assistants had, um, uh, sorry, the lifestyle assistants had um, other responsibilities 
from a paperwork perspective Correct. as well, didn't yeah. they? they? Yeah, so they were, to... they would help us with client, they were um, client file sort of stuff there. So they would help try and, we would help to try and keep up with, you know, the epilepsy plans and things like that. They would help us try and keep up with those um, yearly documents as well as make it helping, they would help us try and get ahead on the road get ahead on rosters and just taking a step back when you said that um there were um documents such as epilepsy plans were yep. they all part of a client plan that was maintained somewhere in a yeah there files? was a folder yeah each participant had a was folder a physical folder yeah it was electronic and physical was both and yeah. the electronic um file was stored where like on the computer on the database you know? yes yeah. was the database sims yes yes correct um and uh, were there ever any issues with accessing sims for for yourself or for lifestyle assistance Oh, if it ever went down? Yes. Yes, it did. Yeah, sometimes oh, I remember there was, oh, it would go to, it would fluctuate, but sometimes it went down for days at a time. Um, and what would happen when it went down for days at a time? How would the work that needed to be done be completed? So for me, in terms of a bulk invoicing process, we would do a bulk manual process, um, which is where we filled out an Excel spreadsheet and manually filled out what was done. Did that take longer than having it completed in Sims? Um, it could have done if you didn't have the templates there. Yeah. Um, uh, just back on the lifestyle assistance, um, were you aware of whether the lifestyle assistants ever had to take work home with them? The actual lifestyle assistants, well, they, some of them, so we had access, they did have access to it on their phones. The Sims, did, thing, any, it was, of you, it was a, did any of them ever let you know that they were having to complete that work outside of hours? Sometimes they did, yes. Because um, sometimes you, they would do things such as, um, they would finish from a participant's house and they, they would do the progress when they got home. Were you aware of whether they were paid for that work? I can't recall. Okay. Um, and um, uh, at paragraph 18 of your statement, um, you uh, describe raising concerns with human resources about the number of clients at the Mount Druid site. Yep. Um, you say that you proposed um, a cap on the number of clients yeah, was... uh, every month. Um, yep. at, who, who did you speak to at Human Resources about this issue? Uh, it, there was a meeting with, can I say their name? It was yes. the, exec, the executive manager. It was... Yes. Um... And um, uh, um, what was the response that you received from, from uh... your proposal? It was that it was not really in line with their vision. Did they explain what they meant by their vision? Well, that there was always this need to be the biggest and the best in the service, in the sector. Um, can I move now on to um, training and in particular training in relation mm -hmm. to um, to health and safety of clients and, and incidents. Yep. Um, uh, when a lifestyle assistant commenced employment mm -hmm. at Afford during your time there, um, what was the induction that they received? We had a buddy shift checklist that was completed. And what, what was involved in that? Um, where we would have um, generally with the seniors would be working with them while still allocated to clients though, um, where they would do a shift, in, they do a shift together on the floor type of thing where they were shown, you know, bits and pieces of where things were and how to find things where the, we had a folder of policies and procedures, things like that, where we'd show them around the sites, where medication was stored, stuff like that, and, and how to work with the participants. And there was a checklist and the experienced team member would check off that they'd been shown. Oh, that's right, yeah. Everything that they needed yeah. to do. Um, and... Um, uh, was a, um, a new lifestyle assistant um, given any introduction to the client plans for the particular clients that would be cared for and any, any general discussion about yeah. the client's needs? We had the client plans um, kept in a folder also um, where we had mealtime epilepsy behaviour support plans. Um, but let's be realistic. Some of these plans were 20 or 30 pages long. How much of this were you going to take in? If we took, if I handed you a folder with 26 epilepsy plans and said, read these, how long do you think it would take before you actually understood that? Like, so that's about 100 plus 200 pages of documents. Um, and um, 
were there policies and procedures in place to deal with identifying abuse and neglect um, and and behavioural incidents, medical um, medical incidents that affected clients? Yeah, there, there were many policies and procedures in place. Um, the knowledge around them, and again, how much of this can we actually absorb? Um, were they given to clients at any point, those policies? Abuse and neglect ones? Yes, and, and incident reporting. The policy and procedure, I can't recall a time where we would have given the handed policy and procedure over to families. Um, I'm, I'm talking about lifestyle assistance. Oh, lifestyle assistance, yeah, they, uh, yeah, they would have been. But they were available in the um, general area. There was a folder that we had sitting that had policies and procedures with acknowledgements attached to them. Um, when you say acknowledgements, does that mean that the um, the lifestyle assistant would read the policy and then sign to say that they had read it? Correct. Um, and that happened when they commenced employment at a court? Um, it wouldn't always immediately happen, but it would happen over, over due time, yes. Um, did it happen, uh, when you say it happened over due time, does that mean it didn't happen on their first day, but you ensured it happened at some point? It, yeah. At the beginning of their employment? Yeah, there was a lot to take in on their first day, yeah. Um, and um, were they um, given any updates or refreshes on those policies over the course of their employment? I can't recall. Really, to tell you the truth. Um, I mean, there would have been time. So we had team meetings where we brought them up. So we had in a team meeting, we would bring up a standard and we would bring up a policy sort of that would work, that would correlate to that standard that we were discussing. That was part of, that was actually part of our paces, part of our bonus structure was that we had to mention, make mention of those things in team meetings. And team meetings occurred how frequently? Monthly. And when they were presented with a policy at a team meeting, um, would um, you or someone else um, take the lifestyle assistance through what was in the policy or any yeah, changes? Yeah, so we would normally, normally I found it um, best practice that one person read it out, um, then everyone else would, then it would be passed around and acknowledged. And each of them would then sign and date a form saying yep. that they had read the policy. Uh, and you said that that was something that was then taken into account in um, something which I'll come to, which is the PACES yep. bonus scheme. Yeah, but in saying that, um, we would be sent emails daily of updated policies and procedures. They, they would change so often um, that, yeah, we would be sent, they might have been, they might have signed to acknowledge something that might have changed the very next day. Um, and um, were the, the policies and procedures about um, identifying abuse and neglect um, or other issues affecting the safety of clients and how to respond to and report those incidents, were they displayed anywhere where they were readily accessible to lifestyle assistance? They wouldn't have been displayed on a wall if that's what the sort of discussion is, if that's the question. There was, there was the folder, and I can't even. We we would go through. <clears throat> sorry, the the folder that had the acknowledged uh, policies and procedures would change and adapt here and there. But I can't even recall exactly. It, it's been so. It's been too long. I can't even recall exactly which policies I had in that folder. Um, and um, what what would happen if an incident arose um, outside of um, the day centre at Mount Druitt. So for example, when clients were out on an activity, what, what yeah. access did they have um, to what it was that they were meant to do in relation to particular clients? When they so were in out? terms of incident reporting, there was generally, it depends on what category the incident was classed as, but most often would be a red alert procedure was generally a safe bet and um, where they would call Again, that changed as time went on. So it would be the operations manager. And then I think as time went on, there was a, a number that they could call that would pass through a chain of different people's numbers. Um, and um, uh, it was your responsibility as team leader to manage red alerts and incident reports? Uh, no, not red alerts. It was the operations or the state manager There was um, where they had to call them. So it came, it was supposed to be a united front of an answer type of thing in terms of response to incidents, which was above my head. And just to just to break down on what um, 
what was to occur on a red alert? Was yep. that was that um, effectively some emergency that was immediately affecting a client? Um, yeah. So um, from memory, it was any client on client assault, staff on client, client on staff, medication, absconding, missing client. I can't think of any others, but off the top of my head, they're the main reasons why you were to call through what, a red alert. What was injury. the um, what um, was uh, was there a, then a set number that um, that lifestyle assistance would have called? Yeah, so um, in the in its in the introduction of the red alert, um, it was originally to go to the operations manager at that time. We it was just her mobile number that we called. Um, and then as time went on, it became a central number that was passed. It, I think the calls would transfer between a, a um, select few different people's numbers until someone answered. Um, and um, what would then happen after the red, red alert was raised by the lifestyle assistant? It, it, immediately, what would happen? Uh, can you give me an example of what an incident that you would like um, me to oh. let, let's assume um for the purposes of this example that a client absconded yep. um, whilst out on an activity what yep. what would be done by the person to whom the red alert was raised yeah so the the first thing would be the first and foremost thing is just make sure the participant is safe so we are gonna i'm gonna try and support so the staff would call um the number and generally speaking from there they we would follow the directive of whoever had answered that call um they would give us a list of instructions to do and it would generally be and then from then on it would be my job to support the staff member as best as possible if i were nearby i would get in my car and drive up there and help um but the but, evidence you gave was that you weren't the person who was contacted in the first instance when a no. red alert was raised no so um how would you find out about it with the with the operations manager then contact you so they should do yeah action? that's right that's right um and um how about in the longer term or they would tell the staff to call me as well um how about in the longer term um assume that the the incident has been immediately resolved and yep. the participants been safe. located yep. um what was done um to investigate the incident and what cause the incident and to communicate with the families about what had occurred? Yeah, so um, I think it depends on exactly where it was. There, there had and exactly what point in time this had have occurred at and who who the upper, who the management team in place was. There have been times where um, I can recall a time where a client has absconded and their executive manager um, at the time went to the shops and retrieved the CCTV footage of that to try and as part of the investigation again to the staff. Um, um, when you say the investigation to the staff, what well, does we that were trying mean? to investigate, like to try and investigate. Yeah, well, the staff would go under investigation where those sorts of things would occur. And um, so, and sometimes so would I. And just turn, just turning to the first thing that you said, which was that the staff were investigating the incident. Um, yeah. Who had management of that investigation? Uh, HR. Um, and um, do you know whether there was any separate investigation or was HR responsible for an investigation that was not into the staff member, but mm -hmm. into what happened with the client and what the outcomes yeah, so, with the client were? Yeah, so they would generally send you a list of, on this date, you were, you were allocated to this client, can you comment? And then on this date, this client absconded from you, can you comment? On the, and then they would ask a sort of list of different questions that would go through that would go through and give the um, staff member a chance to explain. Um, and then, as a result, HR would give the staff would staff member would respond, and then um, they would come back with a conclusion at the end of that. Um, and the conclusion, what were the outcomes of the conclusion? Were they outcomes for the employment of the the staff member they or they outcomes for the client no outcomes the client for, the, for the staff member. member yep and i would often and i would have a list of things that i had to perform and think if i had a performance management plan to implement with that with that particular staff member um and it's the case isn't it that some incidents also needed to be reported to the ndis yes that's right so who's resp was, whose responsibility was it to uh, determine whether or not um a red alert that was raised was a reportable incident uh, that was district manager 
Um, and um, so we could identify if they were reportable, but we didn't go through and complete reportables. Once a red alert had been raised, um, what records were created of that red alert? Um, um, so we had the incident report that was okay. done. That was done through Sims. And um, was that governed by a policy governing incident reports? Well, there's an incident report policy. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, um, can the witness um, be shown a document at um, hearing bundle E tab ten? It'll just show up on the screen next year. Yep. And this is the incident report procedure um, that you were referring to. Yep. Um, and at um, 3.1, it's um, got responsibilities on staff members who witness a report or are involved in an incident to submit an incident report before the end of their shift. Yep. Um, and then team leaders, and that would include you are responsible for yep. reviewing those incidents and recommending strategies to address the incident and prevent reoccurrence. Correct. Um, and then going down to paragraph 3.4, yep. um, district managers are responsible for reviewing and submitting serious incidents incidents for completing and submitting immediate and five-day reportable incidents to the NDIS. Yes. Um, and um, in your experience, were each of those steps adhered to with every incident um, that um, occurred at a Ford? So even down to the fact of trying to get the, it, the policy is not exactly a realistic approach. Like to say to a staff member that you must complete um, an incident before the end of your shift is not really a realistic approach. Sometimes the incidents were that there was a significant injury that had occurred to them. Um, or it may have occurred in the transport on the way back home. to the centre. Yeah, that's just right. Before the end yeah, it's, it, that's not a realistic approach, to, not a practical approach to, a pol to how things actually played out. Um, and um, uh, in paragraph 4.5, which is um, commences at the bottom of um, page one, but then yep. um, goes over onto um, page two, yep. there, there's a list of duties. And in particular, about the fourth bullet point down on page two, um, there's um, uh, responsibilities of team leaders in completing yep. a review of the incident report. Yep. Um, and you can see there that it's got um, uh, reviewing the completion of the incident report, conducting an investigation, mm -hmm. debriefing staff, yep. identifying corrective strategies and developing a performance management plan. Yeah. Um, uh, how did you um, uh, undertake each of the responsibilities in this part of the report in practice when an incident occurred? Again, in practice, it's, in theory, it's great, but um, we can have a look and we can do all these things um, where there's actually... Sometimes, sometimes there was just simply a record keeping incidents done just for basic record keeping, just to make sure that, you know, when it comes time for, re, you know, review of funding or things like that, that we've got a record of incidents that are occurring. But then for much more serious incidents, um, we would do them as much as possible. We would do all this, but um, again, it was often for when we're talking about reportable serious and critical incidents, um, often the actual investigation was done by human resources. We would do as we would do our own investigations as much as possible, and we would liaise in, in and out with he, human resources. But um, did the out, did an investigation that was undertaken by human resources um, achieve the outcomes that are identified in in the paragraph I've just taken you to? Such as did it involve? providing feedback to staff, identifying corrective strategies and preventative ac actions for the client and developing a performance management plan. Do you remember HR achieving those outcomes in their investigation? Um, yeah, well, in particular with like performance management plans and things like that, that would get put in place by as 
they would often be put in place as a result of an, out, an investigation outcome from human resources to me. Um, but conducting an investigation as required comes down to um, how, like transparency of what's actually occurred on the day or the time. Like how, how, do, how are we ever gonna conduct an investigation? I'm not, I'm not an investigator. Um, uh, you've given, um, you've told the commission about uh, the administrative tasks that you had to undertake on a daily yep. basis. How much of your time were you able to devote to undertaking investigations yep. and then engaging with uh, staff and, and support people about what occurred in relation yep. to incidents? Um, when it came to incident response, we, especially if, if we're talking in response to a critical incident, we didn't have any option. We had to make sure that we had to make sure that we were responding to these sorts of things as much as possible. It just meant that we had less time at home that night, you know, or we were catching up more at home that night. So, so again, it was work that that bled into your private time, and you weren't receiving any pay for that. Correct. Um, uh, can um, we now um, look at a different document? Um, it's Hiri Bundley, tab fourteen. Ms. Gleeson, yes. uh, note the time. How much longer are you likely to be with I Diane? think with this witness, I'm going to be probably another 10 or 15 minutes. Sorry? Another well, 10 we're, that's going minutes. to put us behind the schedule. Yes. Let, let's do it in 10, shall we? Yes. Um, can I um, ask you, um, have you got um, the document behind hearing bundle E tab 14 um, on your screen? Abuse and neglect. Abuse and neglect policy. Yep. Um, can I just ask you to turn um, very quickly to um, uh, at the bottom of the page, you've got um, uh, 5.0 procedure. Yep. And then there are some definitions there, including of client abuse, assault, et cetera. Yep. And then it goes over the other page with a number of other concepts. And then if you turn over to page um, four, um, there's then a, a detailed account of recognising signs that may be indicators of abuse. Yep. Um, uh, were you and were lifestyle assistants provided with any training on abuse and neglect concepts of these abuse and neglect concepts? We had, so we had the standards hanging up in the, in the centre, which outlined what it was. We had access to these policies and procedures. Um, this particular one, it's not exactly flagging anything in my memory bank. We did have the folder there with policies and procedures in it. Um, but in terms of actual, like, I, I can't recall, but it's been a long time. Um, and um, uh, can I ask generally in relation to the documentation um, that, that related to both these procedures yep. and also in relation to clients and that's the the client files that were available on sims and in hard copy yeah um you've you've told the commission that uh that involved a large volume of information yep. um, that was written and it's right isn't it that when it comes to things like medication management plans and epilepsy management plans that involves a lot of medical terminology yes um uh of the lifestyle assistants that were employed um, at Mount Druitt, about what proportion would you say um, had English as a second language? Um, it would be about it would be at least fifty percent of my of my mainstay team while I was there it would have been around probably around the fifty percent mark. Um, did you um, observe that that presented any challenges for, for those lifestyle assistants to absorb and understand the documents that they needed to understand to care for the clients yep. that they were assigned to? Uh, yes, it wasn't. It wasn't always immediately identified, but at times you would see um, their written their written skills um, yourself when you were, you know, auditing progress notes and such things like that, where you could actually that was where it was identified that. I'm not sure it would be the fact of English as a second language. It may be that. Uh, I mean, you could be born in Australia. Deficiency in English yeah. might be a problem. There are actually bilingual and trilingual people in this country. Um, uh, 
to the extent that you observed that any um, lifestyle assistants were having difficulty with understanding the written documents that they were presented to, um, were you aware of any steps that were taken to ensure that uh, they were taken through the plans and could understand and absorb them? Well, I can think of an example of a, of a staff member that, that I managed out at Windsor who uh, was diagnosed with dyslexia as an example, and she would um where possible we would read them out if not she would ask to take policy home where her daughter was able to sit with her and read out the policy with her and before she, she signed and acknowledged and, and was she paid to do that additional work to be on top of the policy not that i can recall um and um during your time as team leader at mount Jewett, did you have any concerns that incidents were um um were being underreported by lifestyle assistance I wouldn't know because I wasn't on the floor to be able to see under-reporting or over-reporting. Um, uh, now, um, but it's safe to say, it's a safe assumption to say that yes, because sometimes human error landed staff with, with formal warnings. So you, it wouldn't be a far jump to, to make to think that maybe I won't report it if it meant that. I'm not going to get in trouble. Um, did you observe at all that the fact that HR was was managing the investigation of incidents might have been a deterrent to any staff members to speak up about incidents that occurred because they thought there might be consequences for that them? That would be a fair assumption. Um, uh, um, I myself was threatened with, if I was late calling into a teleconference, which commenced at 8am in the morning, that I would receive a formal warning. Um, and on how many occasions did that occur? Oh, we were told that that would occur weekly. And if we if we called in late, by the time roll, we were sometimes lucky that by the time roll call made it through that we were there. All right, I'm just gonna wrap up with some um, very quick final questions. Yep. Um, you, you've since um, concluding your employment at Mount Druitt, you've um, yep. now worked for a number of other um, disability organisations yes. um, and at paragraph 38 of your statement you uh, and following of your statement you identify a number of issues with the way that Afford operated uh, and we have them in your statement but I was wondering whether you could tell the commission um, based on your experiences at Afford and your experiences at the centres that you've worked at since yeah um, some of the ways in which you think that um, the services operated at day programs could be improved so as to maximise the benefits to the clients. Yeah. Well, one of the main things that I've sort of that I've highlighted throughout this is that with the introduction of the NDIS, there's been a bit of a billable hours sort of model go on here where participants, where you know um, services are sort of forced to um, make sure that, you know, if money's not coming in, money's not going out. It's given the idea in their head that bigger, you know, of trying to obtain more and more clients, more money, and they've turned people into dollar figures. It's created risk and this model that we need to get bigger to make more money to service our overheads as time's gone on. You know, there's, it's, it's a risk to these clients when, they're being put when they're being put in a position where they are a dollar figure and with a rapid growth model it means that we're not always able to catch some people that are sliding in through our doors here traditionally as a team leader our jobs are meant to lead a team that's what the job is but we're stuck behind computer screens we, we weren't able to catch our staff we weren't able to look at them you know we weren't able to see you know a pattern of behaviour with our participants when matched with certain staff. And they were left vulnerable and open because of that. Um, and in, in paragraph 46 of your statement, you say that it's a positive thing to have competitive service offerings, offerings but it, that should never stop disability service providers from keeping eyes on their clients and offering a genuine service. Is that right? That's correct. Um, all right, I'm sorry, where, where was, which paragraph was that? Um, I believe it was paragraph 46. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Uh, and um, just one last question. Um, you've given a number of examples in um, the evidence you've given to the Commission today about um, the amount of um, time that is dedicated by lifestyle assistants and yourself to completing yep. administrative tasks yep. um, and the impact that has on um, providing appropriate services to clients in accordance with the NDIS okay. plans. What are your suggestions for how that can best be managed um, by disability service providers going forward? Well, not only is it the disability service providers, this has to come some onus on the structure of the funding also where we need to possibly look at ways where we can empower our staffs to have a genuine understanding of participants. But there needs to be an allowance for training funding buckets in, in play as well, where staff, you know, the NDIS might turn around as an example and say that people need to be dysphagia trained. But we can tick, we can tick a box and put staff through a formal dysphagia training, but that doesn't actually necessarily teach the staff member on how to read the mealtime management plan to support the person, to give the actual genuine understanding of the staff member to the participant. You can train someone on what dysphagia is and identifying it, but does that actually teach you how to work with it, with a particular person and identifying it with the individual, the genuine actual understanding of people, of the individual person, not just a definition of what we need to identify as, as a hazard, but what it looks like when you're actually working with it day to day. And would one of the solutions be to either allocate a dedicated um, staff member who is able to provide cover so that people could, could undertake necessary administrative tasks like updating client files yeah, that while could still be. maintaining customer ratios? Yeah, that could be that could be one way around it. There and could also be, you know, client free weeks or things like that being introduced, you know. Where so paid time in order to allow um, yeah. allow staff members to do all of the administrative tasks they need to do that are relevant yeah. to client care, and then they can spend their time when the clients are actually at the centre. Yeah, and even clients. to come from a team leader as well. I I, rem I recall back when I first started, my team leader took a week off out of the office to help me. You know, I, I was trained for a week straight from my team leader when I when I left school. And, and in a perfect world, that person would be paid for their time. Oh, yeah, both of us. But yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. There may be some questions from the commissioners. Thank you. Uh, Diane, if it's okay with you, yep. uh, <clears throat> I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions and uh, that I hope won't take too long. Commissioner Bennett. <laughs> On notice. <clears throat> um, I just want to turn to just a few things in your statement yeah. and, and thank you for talking to us today and sharing your experience. Um, on paragraph 13, you talked about a Ford's relationship with the schools in the area. Yeah. Um, so if I got this right, that the customer officer that would go out, the recruiter, yep. for want of another word, would go out to the school. Yep. Were they skilled to be able to assess if a day program was the right thing for that person or were they um, really there just to increase the numbers? Um, from my experience, the customer care manager was actually one of my subordinate support workers at one stage, and then she was promoted into the customer care manager position. So there was no formal qualification. So they wouldn't have been in a position to advise no. and the no family to say the day program is not the best place for that individual? Um, no, that's correct. Yeah. So that was that, their job was to sell. That. And do you think the school or the family knew that they were paid a commission? No, I don't believe so, no. Okay. Um, and when that person was trying to recruit or increase the number of clients, um, would they actually have any understanding um, of that goal to build capacity and independence and then match what the individual person with disability needed and what was offered at the day program? Sorry, can you repeat that? Did they know enough to see how the goal of capacity building and independence, which is in the service agreement, yep. that would be fulfilled at the day program? Mm, no, no, they wouldn't know. They Once, they, once the participant was trans, like, once the participant was with us, then they stepped back. There was no follow-up from that point on. And did you as the team leader with, or should team leaders have 
looked at that component about building capacity and independence in looking at what activities that individual would do. In what way, sorry, would you mean that? Well, we heard from some witnesses that there were times where there was just watching TV, that people lost, lost communication skills, um, that they lost or weren't helped with other life skills that were needed. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to see where this sat as the forefront, this building yeah. capacity and independence. So we offered some capacity, we offered capacity building programs as much as possible, such as, um, you know, the work experience and the cooking programs and things like that, um, in conjunction with the allied health teams as much as possible. The problems start to lie when you've got a centre with so many people and resources going further, being stretched further and further. So it became became harder just to the minding. Yeah. yeah. It, it, um, minding is a not really something I would agree with personally, but the resources stretched thinner. And do you have any sense how many of the clients came directly from Ford residential oh and in so, the day program so how many resided in a reform a Ford let's say group home under my and under Mount Druid I'm just trying to think of I can't actually think of any we didn't have any group homes in the area towards Mount Druid for them to attend because there's now there's now a um day there's now a group home in Mount Druitt that was my day program that's now turned, converted to a group home, but because I didn't have a whole lot of them around there, um, we didn't have see any residential participants attending our day program. Um, and when I when I was in Windsor, they didn't own the group homes out there at that particular point, so I can't really comment a whole lot. Um. I think it's probably better if we ask a Ford about that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner McKeown. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Diane, for your evidence. A couple of matters that I want to understand better. Yep. We heard from parents yesterday that when they first met with a Ford or, you know, at the beginning of the commencement of the day program, they wanted their child to ensure that they had the communication devices or the iPad or the AAC and that that should be part of the day. Yeah. And we heard that that wasn't the case. Do you have any observations on that? So in my time, we had our own iPads that were available, that were available to the day program, and, but it wasn't actually something that we restricted in, our, in, in my management. That was something that around the 2014 mark where this was maybe a more prone issue. Um, iPads maybe weren't as common back then, but it was certainly wasn't an issue under my, if, if there were participants with iPads later on. But by that stage, I actually can't recall whether Simon brought his iPad to the best of my knowledge. So is it fair to say that what, from what we heard from the parents yesterday, yeah. they felt some of their children's communication capacity declined because there wasn't an effort to be person-centred for that adult or well, that adult child particular communication needs. Is that a fair observation? That's a fair observation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. One final question. When Ms. Gleeson asked you about your attempts to meet or address with human resources you're concerned about you know the rapid growth and yep. too many clients how did you feel about the response and what would you have liked to have seen happen by that stage i was kind of at my wit's end really at that, at that stage i knew that i knew that i was no longer a part of their bigger picture i could already see that they were ready they with they were ready to part ways with me and by that stage um, I wasn't overly surprised by the response. So I was burnt by then. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, 
Diane, there are a lot of questions I could ask, but I think we had better move on. There are other issues we're going to have to deal with uh, today, but thank you very much indeed for coming and giving your evidence. We appreciate uh, what you have brought to the Royal Commission, and we understand it's not an easy thing to do to uh, tell us of your experiences in the way that you have, the, and it has been extremely helpful to the Royal Commission. So thank you very much indeed. We do Glad appreciate it. Um, Ms. Gleeson, 15 minutes, shall we say? Uh, if I could just interrupt briefly, I'm unsure whether there are any other sorry? parties. I'm unsure whether any other parties wish to ask any questions in the way that anyone ordinarily offers. Very good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's now 1.45 more or less. We'll resume at 2 p.m. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, I think there's one more appearance uh, to be announced uh, on behalf of Erin, uh, I think. Is that right? Yes, Matt was for witness, Erin. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, Ms. Grace. Um, now, um, your name is known to the Commission, but today we're going to refer to you as Erin, that's right? Yes. Um, and your address is also known to the Royal Commission? Yes. Um, you've prepared a statement for this hearing. Right. Um, and for the benefit of the commissioners, uh, that statement is at hearing bundle A, tab 56. Yes, thank you very much. You've got uh, a copy there with you? Just before you, I'm so sorry. just before you go on, just thank you oh, very I'm much sorry. for coming to the Royal Commission today uh, to uh, give evidence. We appreciate the assistance you're giving and also the statement you have made. Uh, what I will ask you to do is, uh, if you would be good enough to follow the instruction of my associate who's just sitting there, he will administer the oath to you. Thank you. I will read you the oath at the end. Please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Erin. Yes, now Ms. Gleeson will ask you some questions. Thank you. Unfortunately, I didn't traverse into any matters that probably required the oath. Um, uh, now, you have your statement there in front of you. I do. Excellent. Um, and um, you, you've indicated that you wanted to make a correction to that statement. I do. And that's over on page six. Yes. And the first line of paragraph 25, there's the date 20, 2018. Yes. And that date should be 2019. Correct. With that correction, are you content that your statement is true? Correct. Um, now, um, you were employed at a Ford from uh, 2016 to 2020. Correct. Um, and you were employed as a lifestyle assistant when you first commenced as a Ford. Correct. Um, and uh, at some point you uh, were then promoted to Senior Lifestyle Assistant? Correct. And when was that? That was at the end of 2017. Um, and um, you uh, were employed at the Mount Druitt Day Program? Correct. Um, when you started at the centre, approximately how many clients um, were there on a daily basis? 34. And... Um, could you um, describe um, to the client, uh, to the commission generally, what the support needs were for the clients who were attending the centre? Uh, personal care needs, uh, feeding that the goals were met, um, taking them out to programs, um, transport. Um, and. Um, I'll just I'll just walk you through your statement. So mm -hmm. I'll keep referring to paragraph numbers mm -hmm. and then just ask you a few questions about what um what you described there. Mm -hmm. um, at paragraph five and six of your statement, you discuss your duties on transport runs involving picking up clients and taking them to the centre and returning them home. Correct. And, and you mentioned there that after about eight months, you suggested um, a change to the way in which transport runs should be organised. Can you tell the commissioners about that? Correct. So transport runs were a little bit all over the place when I started. 
Um, I was a lifestyle assistant at the time. Um, I approached the team leader at the time and the seniors at the time if I could put in place transport runs. So staff went going around all different areas. So we put together transport runs for a bus to go to the Colton Erskine Park St. Clair and then the Mount Druitt area. Um, so buses would go out to like Oakhurst, Hebersham, Darick, Lackett, um, and then into Bidwell, Wayland, the Fridge Park. Um, once this was done, there was a routine happening. Clients were picked up on time. Family members knew what staff members were coming and they knew what time the buses were coming each morning. Um, just jumping to a different part of your statement, um, at paragraph 30, which is on page eight, um, you also mentioned that from 2018, a board changed its practices so that more than one staff member would do the transport runs. Can you tell the commissioners about how that change came about? Uh, we're getting more and more epilepsy clients on our transport runs. And for the safety of the clients, I uh, went to my team leader at the time and asked if she could get approval for more staff to be on the transport runs. Um, I take it that you were watching um, the broadcast of um, the evidence that was given by the parents of some of the board clients yesterday? Correct. Do you, um, do you remember some evidence being given from some of the parents of the clients that the ratios provided for in their services agreement might not have been achieved during transport? During Correct. And do you remember um, that they also said that on occasion, the time of arrival of buses was variable and that that caused them distress and inconvenience? Correct, because changes did happen around 2019. And what were the changes that- New team leader was put into place. Um, and um, and you, you've given some evidence about, um, about the way in which you'd suggested that transport runs should be organised. Did that change when this new team leader came to Correct. the centre? Uh, and what happened then? Uh, staff. The regular staff that did the transport runs, which were permanent part-timer staff, were taken off the runs and casuals were put onto the runs. Um, so transport was showing up late, different staff members then were showing up, which affected the family members and the clients also. Um, and um, if I can take you back now to paragraphs nine and 10 of your statement. Um, and in those paragraphs, you talk about the information um, that you received when you first started at Afford and then um, in relation to clients for the period of your employment. Can you tell the Commission um, what information about clients that you think it's important to know so that you can support them effectively throughout the day? I think you should know all their diagnosis, um, you know, to behaviours if they're on medication to epilepsy, if they have autism, if they're verbal, non-verbal. It was very important to have as much information on each client to provide service. Um, were you confident um, during your time at a board that that information was stored in a way that you could readily access it when you needed it so that you could um, attend to a client's needs? It was easy accessible, um, but client documentation wasn't up to date. Um, when you say it was e easily accessible, where could you access it? In the team leader's office in a wardrobe. Um, and um, uh, was it also stored electronically? Yes, on SIMS. Um, were there any, ever any difficulties with accessing the information on SIMS? Yes. Um, we had no internet a lot of the time and SIMS would crash. Um, and um, when, when SIMS would crash in that way, um, your only recourse then was to go to the paper file? Correct. Did you ever take any steps um, at any point in time to ensure that there was access to the client's paper files in other places other than the, the um, team leader's office? Correct. I um, introduced a folder for epilepsy. I introduced a folder for their medication and I introduced a folder for the mealtime management plan. And that was located at the front door of Paul Street. Every access bag had the information inside. Each van had the information inside. So it was accessible for the clients to be getting the right And service. about when did that happen? We promoted that in 2019. Um, and um, can you just tell the Commission very quickly about access bags and what their function was? So access bags was to go out with the staff 
um, and in the access bag was sunscreen, cutlery, cups, the mealtime management plan, epilepsy plans, medication plans, um, gloves, wipes, and um, incontinence pads. Um, can you talk to me about how easy you found it um, reading and absorbing the information that you needed about clients? Did you find that difficult at any time while you were at Accord? At times, yes. Uh, and can you explain some of the, the things that interfered with your ability to, to keep up to date about client information? Um, mealtime management plans could have been a little bit tricky. You could be on the first, uh, first page of a mealtime management plan and it would state um, the client's food had to be cut down into small bite pieces and then you flip over and then you had a photo of how their food texture should be. And then you read further and then it'd be stating, okay, the client's food needs to be cut down to um, small bite pieces, but moist. So it was different information from the first page to the second page. So then you have to go and clarify with the team leader on this situation. Um, you, you told the commission just before that um, you um, that some of the client information was um, incomplete or out of date. Correct. Um, what were some of the reasons you observed as to why that was happening? Well, we're all just under the pump. The workload was horrendous and some of the information by customer service wasn't given. All family members didn't provide the right information also. Um, to the extent that you're under the pump and you needed to find time to, to read up on the information about clients from their files, um, how would you make that time? In the morning between eight and nine when there was less clients or any time after three and four. Um, and um, did you um, ever find that you needed to, um, to um, inform yourself about the client files outside of working hours? No. Um, There was also um, a mechanism for recording client information in communication books, is that right? Correct. Um, and um, was that one of your duties to complete the client books whilst you were a lifestyle assistant at Correct. the court? Um, and what sort of information was recorded in those books? Uh, we record what they did for the day, how the day was, and what they ate, if they ate well, and that was basically... Um, and was that did that that book need to be completed on a daily basis? Correct. Um, we we heard some evidence yesterday from some of the parents of the clients that communication books weren't always filled out, depending on which lifestyle assistant was uh, was assigned to their client. Um, do you remember receiving any complaints from? I don't support recall. People don't no. recall. Um, just turning to um, paragraph 13 of your statement, that's over on page three. Um, um, you referred um, there to there being um, issues with um, having dedicated paid administrative time to read and familiarise yourself with what was in the client files. Correct. Um, and do you think that that would be an advantage to make sure that lifestyle assistants are properly informed about the information that, uh, that they need to properly care for clients? Yes. yes. Um, and um, you also refer to issues with getting paperwork completed. Mm -hmm. um, can you um, describe some of the paperwork that you were required to complete while you were at a board um, at Mount Druitt? So around, the, um, we had PACES um and like due to the internet always crashing on us and sims crashing um i would do a brief note on the paces paperwork i would take some of the paperwork home and complete it at home um and like yeah we just we didn't have the time like we just ran out of time uh in relation to paces could you just tell the commission what paces means yeah i uh, so we had a monthly audit check and that was medication audit, um, inspection audit of the premises, first aid kits, medication, I think I just said, um, 
and fire, fire drills. And was the purposes of, um, of that PACES documentation that needed to be completed tied to bonus um, benefits for Correct. staff? And who got the, bo the PACES bonus benefits? Uh, seniors, team oh, leaders, uh, I believe just, uh, the district managers, and if any of the lifestyle assistants helped out. So was the way it worked that there would be a lot of paperwork completed in relation to, to medication, to, um, to the way in which the centre was constructed, to whether or not training was being adhered to. Um, and once that documentation was completed, there would be a bonus pay paid to a team, team leader and some of that would be allocated to any lifestyle assistance that, that helped helped to complete the paperwork? Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever receive any benefits from the, um, from the PACES scheme? Twice. Um, uh, did you find that um, that the Mount Druitt site regularly um, achieved its PACES goals? No. Um, so there was only a couple of incidents in which a bonus was received. Correct. But nonetheless, on every occasion um, that, that the PACES review time came up, you had to complete the paperwork and spend that time. And you just said that some of that time was yes. completed um, after your working hours. Correct. And were you paid for that time? No. No. Um, now, um, I want to talk to you about your promotion to Senior Lifestyle Assistant um, uh, in 2017. Um, you talk about that from uh, paragraph uh, 17 and at paragraph 22 of your statement, um, you refer to being provided with a document that listed your duties. Correct. Um, and I'll just take you to that document. It's um, Hearing Bundle A, tab 57. Thank you. Have you got that? It's just on the screen just, yep, uh, to your right too. there. Yep. And this sets out the duties that you had to perform on each day when you were a senior lifestyle assistant, is Correct. that right? Correct. Um, and um, it's got, um, first of all, a list of activities that were to com be completed between um, 8 and 9 a.m. Yes. Um, and uh, there's dealing with transport runs and then um, uh, where it's got make appropriate changes. Um, can you just describe where the bullet points are underneath that and what you needed to do in relation to each of those matters? So to make appropriate changes could be um, looking at the casuals. Um, we had to know if they had the afford training so we could put the right staff with the right clients so the clients needs were met. Um, changes to transport runs. Um, also additional to we also had to make sure that we had the right clients on the transport runs because some clients did clash with other clients. So yeah, so there was always an additional adjustment. And that was all to be done on, on a running board, which Correct. then let the lifestyle assistants know what they were to do for the yes. day. Um, and um, then uh, underneath the bold um, writing, check, respond and action, any emails, um, there's now a list of other things that need to be done to prepare for the day, including complete any outstanding paperwork, including any new client files. Correct. Um, how often was there outstanding paperwork to be completed during that morning part of the day? A lot. Um, looking at all of the other tasks that um, needed to be done to get ready for the day, um, did you find that there was enough time to get outstanding paperwork done? No. During that allotted period? No. Um, and um, if I can then just take you down to the bottom of the document um, under the time period 3 to 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. This is again at the end of the day. Um, uh, there's the first thing that you need to do is to check parent carer group homes are signing off from the transport run and also communicating with whoever is signing off about information they need to be informed of. Mm -hmm. In your experience, was that something that occurred during, um, during transport drop-offs? Correct. Um, and um, uh, then um, the, 
again, underneath the bold entry, you've got it's got send client allocations. Can you explain what that means? So client allocations have to be sent through to the district manager and also the team leader had a copy. Um, and then, um, and, and, and what do client allocations mean in this context? So their ratio. So we would do for day program. Yes. We worked off a board and client allocations would be, you have your one-on-ones, you one to twos, you one to threes. And are they the client allocations for the day that's just been completed or for the following day? The day that's just been completed. Um, and um, then there's at the bottom of the page, complete again, complete any outstanding paperwork, including scanning, uploading progress notes. Mm -hmm. Was it part of your duties as um, senior lifestyle assistant to um, complete the progress notes for clients? Not all clients, and you alloc uh, allocate only the clients. ones that you for whose care yeah. you were allocated that day. Yeah. Um, and again, um, in the time that was available, um, being one hour before four pm, um, did you generally have enough time to complete the progress notes within that time period? No, some clients weren't picked up on time by group homes, um, and unfortunately, we had a curfew that we had to be off the premises at four. So some clients still weren't even picked up around four. Um, and if the clients weren't picked up, we had to take them out of the centre and go around the corner of the street. So there was times where we had no time to, com uh, to complete progress notes. Um, can I just ask you about um, having to go around the corner and wait with clients on the, on the street? Was it the case that you needed to vacate the premises because there was a neighbour who yes, objected to mm -hmm. people being on the side up at the end? Yep. Um, does that mean that in order to to comply with the curfew, clients were being taken outside and just waiting outdoors in the street, Correct. regardless of weather. Mm -hmm. Rain, hail or shine. Um, I think uh, you said that this document that we're looking at mm -hmm. was the first time you were told what your duties were. Is, is that right? Yes, so the previous team leader, um, when I first started to become senior, um, was, I was basically told that I was to run the floor and to help with transport. And then as the team leader role got bigger, the senior role got bigger. But when you were appointed senior team mm -hmm. leader, was this document presented to you at that time or did mm -hmm. it come? No, a couple of months after. Come when you got the document, uh, which says, for example, towards the top, doing inductions when needed, what, did you understand what you had to do when staff you did induction, an induction? When I first started, yeah. And then we had to do staff inductions as well. But my point is, did you, did you, were you given guidance as to what an induction was supposed to cover? No. How did you work it out? We just fed off each other. So we did an information induction, like when I went in there, like, a, you know, my first day when I went in, I got shown the fire point safety. I got shown photos of clients, um, got shown where medications were kept, chemicals, clients, folders. Um, and because we had no time to read clients' folders, we would feed off each other about the clients. Um, that's all, yeah, my induction was. So it was learning on the job for everybody. Yeah, correct. Uh, we heard a little while ago from Diane in her statement, uh, she didn't call it Peter's principle, but she referred to Peter's principle in that she said that uh, there were internal promotions. And what that meant was that people got promoted to the level of their incompetence. Was I'm not talking about you, of course, but was that your experience of the process within this organisation? Yes, I believe so. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, just turning over to the second page of that document, um, at the top there's some wording in italics, um, uh, and in particular it says if you need to complete any admin between 9am and 3pm, always seek approval so you're covered as to why you're doing admin during those hours, mm -hmm. um, uh, is the reason why approval was needed for that is because if any paperwork was to be done during the hours of nine and three, someone else would need to cover the clients um, 
that you were supervising. Correct. Um, and uh, so as to make sure, firstly, that they were supervised, and secondly, that um, staff ratio, staff to client ratios were maintained. Correct. Were there ever any occasions on which, because paperwork needed to be attended to, um, staff to client ratios weren't achieved for a period of time? No, we never um, dropped the client's ratio for us to attend paperwork. Um, the only time that client's ratios were changed if we were lack, lack of staff. Um, and um, in circumstances in which client ratios were, stay, were changed because there was a lack of staff, what was done then in uh, order we, to make we, sure that the ratios were still achieved? I would contact the families um, in regards to letting them know we were short staff and could we please provide one-on-one -on -one service the following day? And we also had to ring our district manager. And you make reference to this um, at paragraph 29 of your statement, is that right? That's over on page mm -hmm. seven. Yes. Um, and uh, you say that when that happened, um, you um, ensured that invoices, the invoices then reflected the change level of support that was provided because of the short staffing. Um, were you aware of any incidences where this didn't happen and clients complained? No. Um, Um, just picking up on a um, uh, point that the commissioner just raised, um, at uh, paragraph 31, um, uh, you refer to there being a new team leader appointed in 2019 mm -hmm. and there being problems with organisation from that time and you've given some evidence about that in relation to transport. Yep. Um, uh, in, in relation to... Sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Um, in relation um, to uh, to rostering for clients, um, you um, give some evidence in paragraph 31 about uh, rosters not being provided to staff with adequate notice so that clients might have been left alone and not, not collected. Correct. Um, Ms. Gleeson, before you go any further, can I just ask about the yes. client allocation? I just want to understand better. As a team, the team leader, did you work closely with the team leaders to provide advice on appropriate client allocation, or were you just told what the ratio would be? No, and the then team, you would advise the, the family. The no, the team leader would communicate to our seniors the ratios. And did you have any active involvement? Did you make suggestions? Did you say, oh, we're not sure if this will work today, et cetera? Was there an active involvement? Yes, there was. Like, if we were short staff, it would not have worked. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, now, you um, speak in your statement from paragraph 40 about challenges that arose in relation to um, turnover of team leaders that were appointed. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you say at paragraph 40 that at least seven team leaders um, uh, were, um, were working at the centres um, that you worked at of your four years at a board. Correct. Um, and can you... Um, Tell the commission about some of the problems that occurred because of the turnover in management at sorry, the centres. I think you said 17. It's recorded. I'm sorry, I it's seven. 17 leaders. I'm sorry. Oh, it's seven. Yeah, so it's recorded as 17. Yes, okay. Um, can you tell um, the commission about some of the issues that arose because of the change in management over time? Yeah, uh, communication was a big effect. Um, uh, things that were put in place being changed, which affected the families, the staff, the clients. Um, and we heard yesterday from some of the parents of the clients that the hard, high turnover of staff at Mount Druid made com communication from their perspective very difficult. I take it from what you just said that you think that's a fair, yep, fair criticism? Yep. Um, at paragraph 43 of your statement, um, you uh, refer to an incident about a client aspirating and vomiting because he was given food contrary to his mealtime management plan. Mm -hmm. um, were you there when that incident occurred? I wasn't. I was in the centre, but I wasn't present when the incident occurred. 
Did you have any involvement in what occurred immediately after the, the incident? After the incident. Uh, and um, can you tell us what happened from the time that you became involved? I assisted the client um, with getting changed because he had vomit all over him. Um, once the client was cleaned up, he was brought back to the table. I then went to the back room and I was folding up clothes because we had to get clothes out for him to change into. So I was putting all the clothes that I had taken out of the wardrobe back into the wardrobe. Um, and there was just also much kerfuffle going around. Um, and then I recall my team leader uh, referring to the other senior that the team lead, uh, that the group home was dealing with the matter. And normally once you heard the team leader say that the group home is dealing with the matter, in my understanding is that it was put through the red alerter system. And then the team leader was following instructions from the red alert team and also the other senior. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and following that um, incident, um, do you remember there being any investigation of what occurred? There was an investigation. I was contacted by HR um, to know what I heard. And the only thing that I heard was the team leader saying that the group home would deal with it. And when you say the group home will deal with it, um, did that mean that the group home would deal with the immediate care of, um, of the client who suffered the joking incident? I can't, yeah, I can't comment. Um, Was that an incident involving, as you recall, a cut up chicken sandwich? A client um, ate a cheese board chip. Right, okay, thank you. Um, and um, do you know whether there were any changes made to the procedures in relation to mealtime management plans as a result of that incident? No. Um, do you know, um, you said that you were questioned by HR in relation to the incident. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether there are any outcomes for the staff members that were involved as a result of the incident? Yes, one lost their job. One lost their job. Um, <clears throat> in your experience, um, were investigations of incidents concerning client safety, behaviour, violence, medication issues or mealtime management issues, um, were they generally investigated by HR? Correct. Um, was, was it a frequent occurrence that what would occur as a result of that investigation was that the staff member who was involved would be given either a warning or would have their employment terminated? Correct. Do you think that that contributed at all to whether or not staff members were willing to report incidents that occurred? Staff members were afraid to report some incidents because I was scared that their shifts would get cut. Um, this directly come from staff themselves. When you say that it directly comes from staff themselves, is it these things that staff had told you over time? Yeah, so more reflecting to around like bullying and harassment, um, issues with the team leader. Um, is the team leader that you're referring to um, now the team leader that you've spoken of on a couple of occasions earlier in your evidence? No. A different team leader on this occasion? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you say, um, and this is at paragraph 23 of your statement, um, that by late 2017, early 2018, um, the day program had grown to 45 clients and your role had become more demanding. Mm -hmm. um, and um, at paragraph 24, you give a description of uh, the layout of the day centre um, and um, and you make reference to the fact that um, uh, there would be up to 55 clients in the space and it was packed. Mm -hmm. um, to your observation, were there any impacts on the services that were provided to clients because of the number of clients that were in the centre? Yeah, it all depends uh, what program was on for the day um, and how many clients were left in-house to how many clients went out on community access. And on days in which more of the um, clients were um, 
resident in the centre and undertaking activities there, did you observe that there are any impacts on the quality of services that they received? It could cause behaviours. Um, and um, was, um, did you find that there was enough space to physically carry out the activities that were allocated to the clients on that day? No. Um, and um, on, uh, um, did you have any concerns about the safety of clients um, while they were in the centre when numbers were at a peak? Yes, because when it was very crowded, um, it did cause a lot of behaviours to occur um, within clients due to the noise of other clients. Um, yeah, and just like the safety of the whole environment in general. Um, was, was there an incident um, in relation to a, a particular client? Um, and you mentioned this at paragraph 25 of your statement um, with being um, difficulties in relation to uh, the space at the Mount Druitt site and trying to accommodate a client's wheelchair that was too wide to fit in th into the doorways. Yes. Um, and um, did you find that uh, the client was getting frustrated by the difficulties in manoeuvring him or her around the site? Correct. The um, and did you uh, report that to the district manager? The district manager was present at the time at Mount Druitt. Um, and um, uh, did you discuss the problem with him or her? Yes. And um, what was the response from the district manager? Tough enough. Um, sorry, did you say that you were told to toughen up? Yep. Um, and what was the name of the district manager? Who uh, Wayne said that Anderson. To? I'm sorry, could you just say that again? Wayne Anderson. Um, <laughs> is that Wayne Adamson? Sorry, Adamson. Sorry. Yeah. Um, um, and at the end of your um, your that paragraph of your statement, um, you say that you felt disgusted by that response and that management didn't care about how their staff or clients were impacted by not having adequate facilities to provide the necessary care, care to clients. Is that right? Correct. Um, I, just staying on overcrowding for a second, um, did you um, also think that uh, there were challenges with the amount of staff members that were able to provide services to clients? Can you repeat that, sorry? Um, uh, did you feel like the resourcing was sufficient so that clients were receiving all of the services that they needed to at the, at the centre when a large number of clients were present? Yes. Um, uh, um, at paragraph 26, um, you speak of the day programming moving to a bigger site in Mount Druitt. Mm -hmm. um, did you find that this resolved the issues that concerned you with the former site? No, there were still issues with the, the new site. Um, can you describe what they were? Uh, fire exits. Uh, there was no windows for airflow to come through. Um, Change room, again, was too small. Um, um, just in relation to the fire exits, um, how many were they? You had the th uh, front door, the main front door, and you had the kitchen door. Um, and did that present uh, any problems with accessibility, for example, for, um, for clients with wheelchairs? Correct. Um, and um, did you also have any concerns about the location of the centre um, uh, where it was in Mount Druitt? I did. I had concerns because we had the metho methadone clinic up the road there was syringes outside in the car park and in the grass area um, and uh, did you ever raise those concerns with um, either your team leader or team leader um, and to your knowledge was um, was anything done to meet your concerns uh, no um, can I ask you to go to paragraph 44 to 46 of your statement that's over on page 11. And you talk there about invoicing and receipts. Um, um, and uh, in particular, some issues um, in relation to invoicing for NDIS and non-NDIS services. Mm -hmm. um, 
was one of the issues that arose that some families prepaid for non-NDIS services um, but didn't get a receipt, so they got invoiced twice. Correct. Um, uh, at paragraph uh, 46, you refer to clients being charged for one-on-one -on -one support, but then being put in group ac activities um, exceeding those ratios. Correct. Um, you mentioned um, that uh, that might be then recorded in the pro progress notes as uh, still being a one-on-one -on -one support. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? So I would have a client on Monday, one-on-one uh, -on -one support, wasn't able to give that client one-on-one -on -one support. So that client was put to a one to two. The next day I would have the same client. And when I went to do the progress note, so it, the next day when I went to do the progress note, sorry, I had put in on Monday ratio for one to two, but then I had noticed that my ratio had been changed to a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and what did you do when you noticed that that had occurred? Uh, I went directly to the team leader and yeah, she denied or didn't know how it changed. Um, you changed that information back though, didn't you? I did. Um, and um, you say in your statement that you were um, angry about what had been done um, because you thought that it could be fraud and you didn't want to be held responsible Correct. when you entered the information correctly. Correct. Um, and um, then um, you say um, at paragraph 48 that by late 2019, you'd lost faith in reporting things like this to anyone more senior um, because your concerns were either ignored or you were made to feel isolated at work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and is one of the examples of your concerns being ignored or, or dismissed the example you gave in relation to your complaints about the door frames at the old Mount Druitt Centre? Correct. And then you also make reference to being made to feel isolated at work. Mm -hmm. Can you give some... Um, examples of, of how that was that happened to you? Uh, I had uh, there was no communication between the team leader and previous senior. Um, I was taken off discussing transport runs, allocations, was told that the other senior would now be appointed to do on the transport runs and the allocations. Um, and um, can I show you an email? Um, and just before I do, um, you you mention in paragraphs forty nine to fifty of your statement um, that you were unhappy under a new team leader that had commenced at Mount Druitt, and um, so that you um, then, after taking a short holiday, moved to um, a, a separate nearby site at Cherrybrook. Is that right? Correct. Um, and. Um, can I show you um, hearing bundle E tab 265C? And there's a series of emails there um, commencing at the top on the 21st of October, 2019. Um, can I ask you to go to the second page um, and the email that's got at the top the date 11th of October, 2019? Yep. Um, and um, uh, the, the names of the recipients of this email um, have been redacted, but you recall receiving this email? Correct. I was, on, I was currently on annual leave when I received this email. And so you're on annual leave. You're at the point where you were on holiday and shortly after that you were going to move to the Cherry Brook Correct. side. Is that right? Correct. Um, and um, at the bottom of the page we can see that this is from the team leader at the Mount Druitt site. Correct. And... Um, uh, I'll just take you through the first couple of paragraphs here. Um, uh, first of all, this team leader complains that after making sure that staff that are on site were doing their job rather than doing her role, um, uh, that team leader spent Friday evening making up for the work that couldn't be done that day. Um, to your memory, was um, it part of the role of team leader to... Um, be present on site to supervise the work of lifestyle assistants and the experiences of clients? Uh, so the team leader's role um, was to ensure that, you know, all staff were doing their job, um, but they did have a very impacted job. They were under the pump. 
um, a lot of team leaders couldn't come out at most times. Um, and when you when you say they couldn't come out, could they not come out because they were attending to to various administrative jobs in their office? Correct. Um, and um, uh, she mentions that um, on this occasion she spent a Friday evening making up for the work that she couldn't get done that day. Um, to your knowledge, was that something that happened to um, team leaders um, on a regular basis? Not that I can recall. Um, and um, she then mentions that uh, she was checking progress notes um, mm -hmm. for plan management clients and that there were 18 progress notes missing and that this didn't include the amount of missing transport entries. So there's two problems there. There's the problem of missing um, progress notes and then also missing transport entries. Can you think of any reason why um, those um, entries wouldn't have been completed at the end of the day? Uh, same again, um, no internet. Sims crashing, staff members may be dealing with behaviour clients, <clears throat> um, staff members may be going um, to hospital with a client if there was um, an injury to that client. Um, and was that something that regularly occurred, that the, the, the work of completing progress notes for billing purposes would not get completed because of either the system wasn't available um, in order to allow that to be done during working hours? Correct or that there was various tasks that needed to be attended to that involved servicing clients. Correct. Um, in the next paragraph, um, she um, mentions that she doesn't want to spend every evening and weekend catching up on her work. Um, and then she says, following on from the other email I sent earlier today, failure to do your job or repeat offenders with not entering progress notes will be referred to HR for performance management. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, when you received this email, um, what was your reaction to it? I was just like, oh, wow. Basically. Was it was it a frequent occurrence that um, you were threatened with being referred to um, HR for any shortcomings in performing some of the tasks that you were assigned during the day? This is the first time. Um, and... Um, uh, was this the only email like this that you received during this end period of your employment? No, there was two more emails that I can recall while I was on leave that went up similar scenario. Um, and then I was cut off emails. Uh, cut off because you were moving to the Cherry Brook site? I, I, yeah. Um, and, um, sorry, sorry, I think you wanted to say answer. Please do it. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, give an explanation why I was cut off the emails. Thank you. Okay. Um, and um, did you speak with any of the other staff at Mount Druid about this email or the other emails that you referred to? Correct. When I got back from holidays, staff did contact me um, and said she was showing her true colours. Um, they felt like they, the permanent part time, uh, permanent part timers felt like they were being pushed out, and casuals were being put in place. Um, so casuals were actually getting more hours than the actual permanent part-timers. When they, um, they felt like they were being pushed out, was that because, um, they, because of any manner in which they were, being, they were treated during the working day or was it because of matters such as their shifts being cut? Yeah, just like their shifts being cut. All right. Um, and um, as a result of there being um, a downgrade in shifts from the permanent part-timers, um, did you notice that there were any impacts on the services that clients received? Uh, yes, transport was a, a major issue. And that, that feeds back into what you've told us before yep. about transport generally being an issue once this yep. team leader commenced employment, is that right? Yeah. Erin, did you feel that this email was an appropriate way to try and deal or resolve the issues that were going Correct. on? Yeah. Did you feel this was an appropriate way? Yeah, I thought it was very inappropriate. Mm, yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, and um, you then said that once you moved to Cherry Brook, your experience was much better. Mm -hmm. um, what, what were some of the improvements that you observed at the Cherry Brook site? Uh, the team leader that was present was, you know, very organised. Um, we had three seniors, so admin got done. So two seniors were able to do admin between eight and nine. 
and three to four. Um, the other senior would be down on the floor in case any clients showed up early. Um, yeah, it was just better run structured clients needs were met. Yeah, it was bigger, bigger environment. Um, and I think I need to correct myself. I think I keep saying, saying um, Cherry Brook is in fact Cherry Wood. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at paragraph 53, um, you talk about returning um, to Mount Druitt and that your experience, at least initially, was more positive. Mm -hmm. um, can you um, tell the Commission what had improved? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, <coughs> the team leader, she was fantastic. Um, Great. Please go on. Yep. Great communication skills. <coughs> <coughs> Made sure the client's needs were met. Um, and um, would, you, would you like some water? I think oh, there's some. That's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, and was one of the other advantages that um, you felt that the um, documentation for clients um, was more up to date during this period? Yes, so we, um, I had another senior work alongside of me and she would have one day admin I would have <clears throat> one day admin and she would have one day admin. We took turns. So paperwork was coming along very like along well. <coughs> um, and um, then at paragraphs 54 to 55 of your statement, you talk about things deteriorating again because a new team leader was appointed. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us some of the issues that arose um, after that team leader started? Uh, client's choices. Clients didn't get a choice. She made the choices. Um, <clears throat> and when, when, I'm sorry to cut across you, when you say that um, she took away clients' choices, was that in relation to their preferences for either doing particular activities or working with particular lifestyle assistance? Activities. Um, and um, uh, um, were there any issues in relation to updating client information that occurred after she, um, after this team leader commenced? I was taken off all that side of it. My responsibilities was um, doing the vehicle checklist for the vans. Um, and so you weren't um, yourself updating client in information. Did you observe that it was getting done by anyone else after that work was taken away from you? Yes, I did. Um, and who was doing it? The new senior that come aboard. And did you feel like that new senior was, was performing the task adequately? Yes. Okay. Um, and... Um, uh, um, you also make reference to staff being rostered for less support than clients were funded for. Um, and you give an example in your statement. Um, uh, can I take you to hearing bundle A, tab 58? <clears throat> and this is a roster for the 4th of November, 2020. Correct. Um, and it's got two um, sections for, um, for programs between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And then at the bottom, there's um, allocations for off-site morning services. Is that right? Correct. Um, and in the middle um, uh, bracket, the second program, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., if you go across um, three of the columns, there's um, an allocation for Michelle. Mm -hmm. And then there are two names above Michelle, um, and one of them, uh, and both of them have got 1.2 next to them. Can you explain what that means? So they're a one to two ratio. So there's two clients, and both of them yep. need to be working on a one to two ratio with yep, um, one a client. Oh, one, yep. And then you're next to Michelle, and um, uh, again, you've been allocated two clients on a one to two ratio. Correct. And Michelle's got a note underneath her entry, and if you go down, to uh, the bottom row, um, you can see that there's a direction to Michelle in the second last column, which says, uh, sign your clients over to Erin during this time to support Apia at Ripples. Correct. And then if you go back to, you can see doing hydrotherapy at, um, at Ripples. Correct. Um, is the consequence of that, that during um, the period where um, Michelle was assisting at, um, uh, the um at the uh hydrotherapy um 
you were taking on clients at a one to four ratio. Correct. And that was contrary to the NDIS plan. That's correct. Um, do you know um, whether for the hours that the clients were supported at a one to four ratio, their plan charges reflected that that happened? I'm not aware. Okay. Um, is the team leader that we're discussing during this period um, still at a port? Yes, she's been promoted. Uh, and what position is she in now? District manager. Okay. Um, uh, now, um, at paragraph 57, you then um, mentioned that you left the port to provide home assistance to Simon. Correct. Um, and and uh, can you tell the commission um, about your observations about the difference in the care that you provide? Um, the difference in the care that you um, provide to your client now versus the care um, that you were able to provide when you were at the Mount Druitt Centre? Yeah, so I provide personal care in the mornings yes. to Simon. I now, Simon now uh, attends uh, community access. Um, Simon can write his name. He can do different initials. Um, he can now cut up food. He is more independent, um, can make choices, um, can identify money, um, their time frame, like he, he will know, okay, it's 2.30, we've got to head home, we can identify the time now, like he's just growing leaps and bounds. Um, and um, uh, is part of the reason why um, you can observe um, um, positive outcomes arising from Simon's care that he's got constant one-on-one -on -one support. Correct. Um, <laughs> is another that um, because your only duty is, is attending to Simon, a lot of the administrative tasks that were involved in working at the busy centre, Correct. you no longer need to deal with, you can just concentrate on him. Um, do you have any suggestions about how day centres can find some middle ground between one-on-one -on -one support and, and the social benefits of attending a centre, undertaking activities with other people um, uh, with disability and achieving those social aspects? Yeah, I believe there should be more staff allocated. Um, should be a floater floating about. Um, yeah, just and the environment really needs to be looked at. And when you say the environment needs to be looked at, can you give um, the, the some space examples? of where they're meant to be doing their programs? And, and what suggestions do you have about how that could be improved? Find the appropriate um, place for the clients to be in. <clears throat> Um, can I ask you briefly um, about um, the training um, that you received when you commenced uh, employment at Afford? Um, is it right that you received, and this is a paragraph nine of your statement, um, an induction about fire exit procedures? Yes. Photos of client? Yes. And an employee pack? which uh, included um, policies such as abuse and neglect, um, medication management, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and um, do you remember um, whether you anyone took you through the employee pack or were you just required to read no, it? No, they were emailed to me and I had to read the policies and procedures myself. Uh, and did and you then, have to acknowledge in some acknowledge, way that yep. you'd read it? Yes. Um, and um, do you remember whether that employee pack was provided to um, lifestyle assistance that started at a Ford after you did? I can't recall. Okay. Um, uh, and um, at um, paragraphs 35 to 37, um, you uh, refer to 
um, some of the difficulties with lifestyle assistance in um, understanding individual client needs. Ms. Gleason, yes. if, if you're just going to take us through what's in the right. statement, we do have that, and I don't think okay. we need to do that in any detail. We have that information very nicely set out for it. Um, just um, uh, staying on the policies that um, were made available um, to uh, clients. Um, do you remember being provided with updates of the policies from time to time? Yes, so we would get an email to say there was an updated policy. Um, team leaders would, well, not all team leaders, some team leaders would um, print the po uh, policy off and put it into a uh, folder, which was next to the sign-in desk at the front doors of Paul Street. And then we have the sign and acknowledgement form that we had read. Um, and at paragraph 19, um, you refer to um, uh, uh, staff meetings occurring once a month um, attended by team, team leaders, lifestyle assistants and senior lifestyle assistants. Correct. And um, you, um, uh, at those meetings, did you receive updates of um, policies from time to time? Yes. Um, Um, can uh, the witness be shown hearing bundle E, tab 265E? Is that the... I'm hoping that that will come up on your screen. Yeah. Um, and then meeting minutes from the 4th of November, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you can see um, at the bottom of the first page under the um, heading new items to be discussed as per agenda. It's got various procedures that are listed. Mm -hmm. And then if you um, turn over um, two more pages um, to page 5105, and then um, over to page 105106, I apologise, it's cut off at the bottom of mine, at the top of mine. Um, there's then a staff acknowledgement sheet um, and it has at the top red alert, Mount Druitt, and then people who, are a, a, a series of um, dates, staff names and signatures. Mm -hmm. um, and um, over the page, it then has uh, the particular policy, which in this case is a red alert policy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and... Um, is it the case that you were provided with those policies at that meeting and then had to sign off Correct. to say that you'd read the policy? Correct. Was there in the meeting any discussion about the content of the policy and what might have changed? No. And um, if I can then ask you to go over to um, 51... One one. Mm -hmm. There's then a procedure for medication management and, and administration. And in the final page of this document, which is five one two three, I'm so sorry. It's um. It's actually five one one two. <clears throat> it 
it's actually back on page, I apologise. I don't have the numbers at the top of um, the document correctly. Ms Gleeson, uh, as Mr Watson will uh, testify, I'm well known for the subtlety of my hints. Yes. Um, I'm in danger of uh, damaging that reputation. So can we <laughs> move towards a conclusion? Um, yes. Um, yes, I'll move away from that document. Um, I, um, I just want to take you to paragraph 61 of your statement. You refer them there to some of um, the, um, if I can describe them without reading about as cultural issues um, that, uh, that cause problems um, at Afford, um, and you've gave, given some reference to that in your evidence. Um, uh, can I ask you for your observations on what can be done to improve the culture at, um, at amongst lifestyle assistants um, at uh, day centres and um, um, and in particular um, some of the factors that you think led to the, pro the cultural problems you identify there? Okay. Yes, yeah, so it was very dis like um, stressful, disheartening um, relationships to be like reflected on each other. Um, incidents. Um, not being supported. Um, um, do you um, have any um, suggestions about um, I'll move on to a different topic um, very quickly. Um, uh, in your statement, um, um, you make some suggestions about things that uh, you think board needs to change to bring the focus back to client care. Um, do you have any suggestions about how it is that staffing and resourcing can be approved improved um, so that the focus is brought back to client care? I believe there needs to be continuity of staff, not such a big changeover, um, and a breakdown on clients' paperwork. So, yeah, a little mini care plan put out on each client, brief rundown on how to support the client's needs. And if some of the advantages that you can obtain from having a mini care plan is that um, that it's up to date, but also that it's digestible so That's that right. yeah, lifestyle assistants can see the issues very quickly yes. and be able to, to yeah. apply them to client care. Yes. Um, and um, uh, do you have any suggestions about how it is that a day centre such as a, um, Afford can increase um, the choices that are available to um, to clients for the activities they participate in, and um, uh, and uh, make sure that they have sufficient input in in making those choices. Yes. And what what suggestions do you have? Well, they've got a, a activity sheet that the clients get a choice to choose what program they would like to do, but I do believe there should be more choices. Um, and would one of the improvements um, be for um, there to be greater consultation with both clients and their support people about what activities they wish to be involved in so that then can be built in, um, uh, to the services that are offered by the centres? Correct. Um, and um, uh, yes, I think I can leave it there. Thank you. Commissioners. If it's okay with you, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions, starting with Commissioner McCune. Uh, no, thank you for your evidence. Commissioner uh, Bennett. Thank you. <laughs> Very, um, just two short questions. In your view, has Simon's outcomes 
and his own personal choice and control being better now he's not in a day program? Correct. And do you believe that for many other people with disability that they would have better outcomes more aligned with the objectives of the NDI's individual plans and goals if they were not in day, day programs? Correct. Thank you. From the time you were promoted, mm -hmm. what was your experience with missed medications at the day program? Was that something that happened often? And if it did happen, what was the reporting process? No, it didn't happen often. Um, I can only ever recall once, um, and it was to be red alerted. So you would call the red alert team, you would say your name, what site you were from, and then explain the incident. So that and was then, the only occasion you were aware of that a participant uh, had medication uh, omitted, not administered properly. Yeah, because, yeah, right. as a senior, sometimes you didn't get told about every incident as well. Yeah. All so. right, thank you. You've made a number of suggestions and they're very helpful. Thank you. An impression I get from listening to the evidence from you and others uh, is, well, really, it's a question, and it's a question that's prompted by uh, a question that one of our colleagues who's not here today frequently asks, is this fit for purpose? And that question arises because I'm having some difficulty understanding how the NDIS system, whether it's individual funding, individual plans, assumptions of continuity of support and care, can actually be accomplished within this environment that you were, and perhaps, well, you're not now, but were working in, where 60 or 90 people are gathered together, where there are economies of scale that have to be used in order for there to be an appropriate, uh, as uh, the management would see it, appropriate use of resources. And I just wondered at a broader level, I understand the particular point you're making, at a broader level, is, is that something that you've thought about? And if so, Am I on the right track or am I missing something? No, you're on the right track. Yeah, I think you're understanding so my That's version. a very good answer. Yeah. <laughs> I like that answer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much. Now, I'll just check as to whether there is anyone who wants to ask you some questions. I am from before. Thank no, you. All right, in that case, thank you very much indeed for the evidence and for the detailed statement that you've given. Um, I think we've learned a lot from your experience, which is very helpful to us. And as I said uh, previously, uh, to uh, and, and um, it's not easy to um, give evidence in an environment such as this, and we appreciate that you have been prepared to do so. So thank you thank very you. much indeed. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, we're now going to take, I take it, Ms. Gleason, a 15-minute adjournment, and uh, we shall therefore resume at 3.30. The Royal Commission is adjourned until 3.30. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Mr. Fogarty. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. The uh, next witness is Samantha Taylor, Registrar of the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. Um, Ms. Taylor's statement dated 22 April 2022 is in uh, hearing bundle C, tab one, a one page corrigendum to that statement dated 16 May 2022 is same hearing bundle C, tab one A. And the Royal Commission would note Ms. Taylor also has given evidence by oral and written in last year's public hearing 20, preventing and responding to violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation and disability services to case studies, and also in uh, 2020 public hearing five experiences of people with disabilities <coughs> during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, thank you, Mr. Fogarty. Uh, Ms. Taylor, thank you again for coming back to the Commission for your uh, third visit. I'm sure they get more enjoyable on each occasion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if you'll be good enough to follow the instructions of my uh, associate, he will administer the affirmation to you.
I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes, for I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, I will now ask Mr. Pogarty to ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Taylor, I understand you have a copy of your statement with you. Yes, sir. Uh, my questions will hopefully follow through the, the paragraphs and sections of that. So if you need to refer to a part or you'd like me to refer to a part, just let me know as we go. Um, firstly, in terms of regis the registration of a forward um, as an NDIS service provider, they, uh, a forward was a transition provider, am I right, from 1 July 2018 to 17 September 2020? Yes, that's right. First registration. Then Afford submitted an application for its current registration on 11 February 2020, and that application was approved and, sorry, its current registration now commenced on 17 September 2020, so that followed on from transitioned registration. Yes, they're the dates I believe are in my statement. That current registration expires on 17 September 2023? Yes. What does registration, if you can tell us what registration means and what uh, Ford had to do in order to get registered? Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's obligatory to be registered to be a provider in the NDIS when providing supports to um, participants whose plans are managed by the National Disability Insurance Agency and also where a provider may be delivering particular classes of support. Um, and those are set out in, in rules. They include things such as behaviour support or um, implementing restrictive practices uh, and, and other um, higher risk services. Um, to be registered, a provider needs to satisfy the commission that they uh, meet um, the practice standards that are relevant to the classes of support that they're seeking to register to deliver. And those classes of support and the, uh, and the standards that apply to them are also set out in the provider registration and practice standard rules. There are different forms of assessment that the commission requires a provider to undergo, uh, but in, in whatever form, uh, there is an in, a requirement for an independent auditor that's approved by the commission to undertake that um, assessment against those practice standards. In addition to that, the provider is required to provide the commission with certain information about, about them uh, and their key personnel, and that enables the commission to also undertake what's referred to in the rules as a suitability assessment. That suitability assessment is undertaken both of the provider itself and also its key personnel. And um, those things together, the application of the provider the assessment by uh, the independent approved quality auditor uh, and the suitability assessments, plus any other information that the Commission might have in, on hand, um, either available through its own um, functions or uh, through intelligence from other parties, is taken in full uh, to consider whether or not under the provisions in the Act, the provider is able to be approved. Um, of course, one of the, the um, requirements in the Act is for the Commission to only um, provide uh, approval for registration uh, if a provider is um, deemed to have met the practice standards as assessed, um, and that assessment, is, as I say, is undertaken by an independent auditor approved by the Commission, but takes account of the, the standards that are specific to the classes of support and the indicators that um, uh, that uh, set out in a prescribed uh, instrument that... Um, and in that this case, uh, is the auditor selected by the NDIS commission or by the applicant? Um, the commission has currently 19, I, I recall, um, approved quality auditors. We have an audit uh, scheme which is administered for us by the um, joint accreditation scheme of Australia and New Zealand. So um, it's overseen by the body that audits audits auditors. Um, Jazz Ants enters into arrangements with a, um, or accredits a body to participate in our scheme and makes recommendation to the commissioner about whether an auditor is um, recommended to be considered by the commissioner as an approved quality auditor. Now I understand 
that there are approved auditors, but the particular auditor who reported on a Ford, was that auditor chosen by a Ford from the panel or does the commission choose that? Um, yes, Chair, the um, auditor would have been chosen by the provider. We give um, providers choice over uh, the auditors that they can um, that they can use uh, off that uh, list of approved quality auditors. Um, of course, that selection is, you know, still requires the auditor, of course, to, to be guided and to implement their audit, undertake their audit rather in accordance with the guidelines that we have available. Yes, I, I follow that. And uh, the auditor in this case presumably provided a report to the Commission, which was taken into account in determining that a Ford was an appropriate body to register. That's that's correct. And because of the, um, in, in the example of, of a Ford, um, because that organisation is delivering a, a, a range of supports and services in the NDIS, um, some low risk, uh, for example, um, equipments and therapies, uh, and some higher risk like accommodation and uh, um, day activities, for example, they were subject to a certification audit. And that means that uh, there would have been, in addition to their initial self-assessment against the, the practice standards, uh, the auditor would have undertaken a two-stage audit, uh, which includes in the first stage, a review of their self-assessment, um, their own exploration of the policies and procedures and guidance that the organisation might have uh, that are applicable to the standards and, uh, and the indicators that support them. Uh, the stage two audit then uh, takes a randomised selection of sites uh, as well as participants or family members to explore okay. their experience with, um, with the services provided by the organisation. All right, Mr Fogarty, uh, I'm sure we'll take you through your statement, but the question I wanted to ask is, and perhaps we can come back to it after Mr Fogarty has done that, and perhaps Mr Fogarty will be doing this, I'd be interested to know if there's been any re retrospective assessment of the auditor's report that led to the registration of a Ford, but we'll come back to that later on. Yes, Mr Fogarty. Ah, yes, thank you, Chair. Before moving on, um, so just to be clear, the talked about the stage one audit, stage two audit, a recommendation then comes from the stage two audit. Is that correct? Well, it comes in full. So the, yeah. the auditor looking at the stage one audit, um, any issues that might've been identified in that stage, the um, organization's uh, activities in response to those matters, uh, then the stage two would form in full a certification recommendation or not yes. by um, a quality but audit. The process is the recommendation to certify or not to certify, that then goes back to the NDIS Commission yes. to do a suitability assessment. Well, that's a separate process to the audit. So the audit recommendation the aud stands um, as right. alone. Does it and feed into the suitability assessment? No, because that, that process is a separate process. And, and done internally with... It's in done internally, yes. The audit the auditor doesn't um, doesn't support the commission with undertaking that suitability no, assessment. No, no, but does the commission... Ha, ha, what does the commission do with the recommendation once it so, comes in as part of the the final steps towards registration or, or, or not approval. So I think I've set out in, in my statement um, some of the stages that uh, the Commission undertakes to form a, um, a briefing, if you like, for a delegate to um, give consideration to whether to register a provider or not. The audit recommendation is one input into that process. Um, as I was just referring to, the suitability assessment is another, but so is information that's available to the Commission from its own activities. For example, um, incidents that are reported to it, complaints that it receives, right. and compliance um, or enforcement action that it might be undertaking. As the Commission, the Commissioner at the end who approves or not approves, correct? Or the, or the Commissioner or the Delegate. Um, yep. And um, I'm obviously one of those um, delegates, as are others. Thank you. Assists in understanding that process broadly. Um, I'll take you to paragraph 12, in, just um, which I think is on the second page. I just want to understand you referred to the classes of support for which a provider can be registered. Paragraph 12, you list those for which a board uh, has been registered to provide since 17 September 2020. There's a couple I wanted to refer to. The C, high intensity daily person activities. 
uh, e-assistance with daily personal activities. Uh, and you'll probably see a theme, these relate, it, it would seem, to the, the day program and supports around it. Uh, assistance with travel tr transport arrangements, specialist positive behaviour support, assistance with daily life tasks in a group or shared living arrangement, innovative community participation, I'm working my way down the list, development of daily living and life skills, participation in community, social and civic activities, group and centre based activities. Um, those are the sorts, in this case, those were some of the classes for which they afford remain registered, as far as you understand? Yes. All right. And I think you referred a moment ago to some of those classes being low risk and some being high, high risk. Yeah, we, we differentiate um, the, the classes of support um, for the purposes of determining the assessment methodology that applies to them. Okay. Um, to inform the registration. Um, however, if an organisation is delivering um, a, a significant number of what um, higher risk supports, as many of which you just um, uh, listed, a, a certification audit of the stages that are described at stage one, um, any non-conformity action and stage two would be relevant to the organisation. Awesome. Um, were you able to follow the evidence yesterday of Sally, Lily, Lily Susie or Rob? I, I must admit I had other commitments. I heard it in part. I was in and out most of the day. Um, have you had a chance to read in, read their statements? I haven't, no. Yeah. I was hoping to be able to read the transcript and unfortunately it's not available yet, no but I will when it is. You, you refer in your statement to, just to be clear, uh, Afford also had its registration very in since 17 September 2020. Is that an application that a Ford or the service provider would make? Um, yes, yeah. so um, it's, it's very regular for um, the commission to receive applications for variation to registration. That may involve the provider seeking a, an adjustment to um, any manner of things, the, the, the period that the registration is in force, uh, the classes of support they're registered for, they might seek to add some, yep. they might seek to uh, remove some. Uh, it's, a, it's a very large um, part of our decision-making. And it's not irregular for an organisation to, um, in making a, an application to, particularly if, um, if they're adding uh, classes of support that attract uh, additional standards that they hadn't originally been assessed against when uh, the Commission made a decision for registration that that um, application is accompanied by a, um, an additional audit report around to furnish us with what we require to make that um, decision to vary or not. One of the variations you refer to from 14 April 2021, paragraph 13, is specialised support coordination. Mm -hmm. um, is that separate to, is that a particular kind of support coordination different to a more broad type of support coordination? Um, like two different things, a specialised a particular type of support coordination? Yeah, yes, it is. Um, I, I can't speak to the nuances of, of what is, these classes of support are really um, connected to the uh, NDIA uh, and their um, catalogue of supports, but yeah. the specialist support coordination relates to um, support coordination for people with more complex needs. needs. Um, prior to that, uh, well, it was a variation. Is your understanding that prior to that, they were not registered for specialised support coordination? Um, I comment? wouldn't, uh, wouldn't appear to have okay. been un unless they were originally transitioned with that class and, and didn't um, then reapply uh, when they um, renewed their re registration. And just so I, I'm clear. Uh, paragraph 12 have, has a list. I referred to some of them, mm -hmm. but is that list you put in, in 12 all of the classes of supports before it was registered for from 17 September 2020? Um, yes, I believe it is. All right, thank you. Um, I'd like now to ask you some questions to gain an overview of um, the NDIS Commission's investigations and compliance actions taken in respect of afford since 2020. I know a number of them are open investigations, so I, yes. I don't propose to traverse those in a way that might prejudice those. I've umbrellaed them in, in a fourfold fashion. Uh, firstly, there's been an investigation into the 23 May 2019 death of Myrna Apram, um, who was an NDIS participant 
and resident in affords care at Woodbine supported accommodation. Just to get the chronology correct, um, the involvement of the NDIS Commission was shortly after the death when a notifiable reportable incident was provided to the NDIS Commission, is that correct? Yes. Um, and then last year, 21 December 2021, the Commission, uh, the NDIS Commission commenced civil penalty proceedings in the Federal Court of Australia. Yes, that's I'm correct. jumping ahead. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're still on foot. Yes. Um, Why did it take so long? to institute proceedings? Um, Chair, in a matter such as that, um, the investigation has to be incredibly thorough. There's a need to um, get evidence from a number of sources and a number of parties. Um, I can, I prefer not to really refer to the process that, that took us to the filing, if, if mm. you wouldn't mind, um, but uh, certainly, the steps of this in, involve then a revision of um, what evidence is available and, and what else might need to be yeah, so uh, obtained. You, you, you can take it. I'm familiar with the process. Mm -hmm, I'm yes. just wondering why it took two and a half years. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank, Mr. thank you, Chair. Um, in your statement, you indicate that they're the first civil penalty proceedings taken by the NDIS Commission um, in the Federal Court of Australia yes. since it commenced in New South Wales. Um, and you indicate that the work necessary to commence those and um, along the lines of what you were uh, or you've been asked about um, was a matter of the highest compliance enforcement priority for the commission in that period of time or has been it was an extremely high priority matter yes and from it and i'll move on to the other parts of my fourfold breaking down of, of the compliance investigation matters other documents and other investigations arose from some of the some of the information that was received as part of that investigation, correct? It was a multifaceted investigation, yes. Um, the second compliance matter or the second matter um, was one that is termed in the Commission's operating system COS as apparent systemic non-compliance. You recall that? You refer to that in your yes. statement. According to your statement, it was commenced on 5 March 2021. Um, and this arose, didn't it, from documents discovered during the NDIS Commission's investigation into the APRA matter, do you recall? Yes, yep, that's a, um, that was a, the creation of a record in our system which collected uh, a number of issues which uh, had fallen out, if you like, from the investigation that, that warranted compliance consideration as opposed to um, potential enforcement pathways. Um, and it, if you want to go look at paragraph 24, I th there's, I think, nine incidents referred to there as there was an initial assessment of this compliance matter and the following nine incidents listed the paragraph 24 of your statement arose. Um, I'll take you through those. A complaint by a participant who alleges that he was hosed down like a dog after soiling himself whilst receiving respite services. And I should indicate this remains an open investigation, correct? These matters. Compliance matter, I should say. Yep. All right. Secondly, so, so just to be clear, the status of this is an allegation by a participant of this conduct. And that allegation has not yet been determined. This is a this is a complaint. Um, I couldn't speak to the status of the particular complaint, um, but these are matters which together um, were at the time considered to be uh, of concern in aggregate about um, systemic issues that uh, warranted our um, investigation in, a comp in terms of our compliance um, well, thank you. oversight. Is it your understanding that um, these nine incidents or alleged incidents um, are, were not matters that were, uh, that had been notified to the NDIS Commission? I think what you, uh, do you mean that they were uh, revealed as far as the investigator was concerned as the result of the investigation into the other matter and had not previously come to the attention of the commission by way of a notifiable incident? Is that thank you, Chair? Captain, what you um, and and I'd say to thank you for that clarification, Chair. But um, no, that would not necessarily be the case. These are um, these are matters that. Um, 
that come into the commission as, as complaints or reportable incidents and our investigators are connected with those other functions of the commission and uh, in the course of their investigation look to other um, pieces of information or intelligence that um, are collected by the commission uh, about a particular matter. For example, if they were investigating as they were at the time of a particular incident, they might look to see whether or not there are other similar examples of, um, of, of issue with um, coming up for a particular provider to see whether or not there are any relationship between those issues and the matter that they're, that they're, that they're investigating. And that would help them determine whether or not um, there was a, uh, the issue that they were in, at the heart of their investigation was an isolated uh, issue or whether or not it, it spoke to broader issues um, on the part of the provider. I suppose my question is, it's, is it the case that um, these incidents could have been notified as reportable incidents? They could, they could have been, and I think I've referred to um, a couple of complaint um, and uh, incidents through the reportable incidents mechanism. Yes, it, it, when you list them, there are references. For example, um, there's a reference to uh, well, the first, the first reference is a complaint by a participant. It's unclear, and I don't mean to be critical of you, whether that's a complaint made to the NDS Commission or a complaint made to a forward that was picked up in documents that I, that I understand was referred to, um, were uncovered or were circulated within the NDS Commission from your statement arising from the investigation into Ms Aprams' death. I'm happy to provide clarification on this. Um, I don't have these matters at, on hand, obviously. No. Uh, Mr Fogarty, this may be something about which we seek some further information, bearing in mind that I assume you're going to be coming to issues relating to uh, the failure to notify notifiable incidents. Yes, thank you, Chair. Sure. Um, the third of the fourfold uh, investigation compliance matters was, uh, do you agree and referred to in your statement um, that on 28 July 2021, the NDIS Commission commenced an investigation regarding alleged misuse of NDIS funding by a forward. It's also an open investigation, as I understand it, with the NDIS Commission. Yes, that's right. Prompted by a story published on the ABC's website uh, and by a report that was on the 730 report on or about that time, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. Um, to your knowledge, it involved serious allegations, and I emphasise their allegations of, of possible failure by a forward to meet obligations in respect of its conditions of registration. Do you agree? If you if it assists paragraph thirty three. Um, yes, I've I've um, included um, an excerpt an excerpt from my own reflections um, on that um, that media um, piece. If you like. And that's um, consistent with what I've said, yes. Yes, so serious allegations of a possible failure in respect to conditions of registration, I think you say particularly practice standards for governance and operational management. Yeah. And secondly, uh, in respect of the code of conduct, acting with integrity, honesty and transparency. Um, in July 2021, again from your statement, the Assistant Director of Investigations completed an initial assessment, noting it's still open, um, and again, at paragraph 46 for your reference, in, in that assessment, there's an excerpt. It was reported to the commission that executives with the Ford had created a culture of excessive spending for staff and employees on matters unrelated to the care of participants. Money would be spent on extravagant functions which returned buzz nights. So that's part of this investigation well that's that um, allegation. describing what it what had been relayed um, in the course of, of looking into those things yes this investigation also uncovered information about uh, mr uh, thomas stumpo is that right yes and that a, was part of the um abc report right and a reportable incident uh well arguably a reportable incident or allegedly a reportable incident involving him in the care of a fort in june 2019 yep that hadn't been reported to the NDS Commission at the time, had it? In no, it hadn't. Um, it, it was reported, wasn't it, approximately two years later, just after the ABC report? Yep, was notified, correct. I should say. Notified, yeah. By a fault. All right. I'll come back to a couple of those uh, 
matters or those uh, investigations. The last, and this is a closed one, relates to the New South Wales and ACT investigations team investigation uh, opened on 4 May 2020 into eight, what became eight reportable incident notifications made by a Ford regarding allegations of abuse of NDIS participants who were clients of the Mount Druitt Day program by Mr. Daniel Nimali, who was a, a lifestyle, a Ford lifestyle assistant. Yes. Um, that, that, that is now closed and closed, I think, in 2020. Yes, that's right. Yeah. All right. Um, in respect of the, taking you back to the alleged misuse of NDI, NDIA funding noting, it remains open. Um, is it the case that as part of that, the NDIS um, requested reportable incident, uh, we'll withdraw that, that the NDIS commission reviewed reportable incident and other data from a Ford, such as its growth and size, um, which reported that a Ford was notifying reportable incidents at about half the rate of other providers between July 2018 and July 2021. Yep, that was the assessment of our um, one of our officers. And is that your intern? That's the data that you. you um, have? I think that was actually based on that particular um, senior leader's um, experience of the of the sector and oh, her um, ability because of her experience to compare um, providers of, of similar size over that period of time. Yep. Um, does that remain a cause of concern for you? Sorry, what does it remain a cause of concern for you in respect of afford that opinion? I've put it as an opinion. I know it's still open. And if you can't comment, you can tell me you can't. Oh, comment. no, I'm happy to comment on that. Um, so, yes, Ford's compliance with its obligations around reportable incidents is a matter of concern for me. And although we've seen, or we've spent, there's been a, a considerable amount of work um, between the Commission. Uh, and with a forward on these kinds of matters. And although we've seen an improvement, I'm still not satisfied. And, and I've, I've, um, I've set that out in my statement and I've, um, yeah, I've, I've commissioned some further work and I've written to the CEO about my intention and an offer to talk through with her what my concerns continue to be. I think, and I will hopefully come to, to that document. Mm. Thank you for flagging that now. One matter you refer to still within this, um, this alleged misuse of NDIS funding is a referral made to the NDIA. You recall that in terms of it issuing a final debt outcome notice? Yeah, the matter's ongoing, um, but of course the commission doesn't um, manage no. funding matters. Um, and so we have a, a, a relationship with the NDIA to explore issues, they have an interest and, and we have a, uh, an interest also, although they are separate interests. This is paragraph 65. Yes, thank you. Sure, I, I, have... I wonder if you could just explain what a final debt outcome notice is and what is said to be owing by a Ford to either the NDIS Commission or the NDIA. I'd like to understand that. Well, there's nothing owing to the Commission because the Commission doesn't act. Um, all right, well, what's, owing, what's owing to the NDIA in that case? Well, I'm, what I'm doing here is conveying what I understand from the information I've seen about a, a dead outcome that the NDIA um, issues where they find that um, they've paid for things they shouldn't have. It's probably a, a question put to better to them to explain how they go through that process and what's in a debt outcome. Uh, notice than, than, than I can um, perhaps give you to the level of detail you might need. Um, but this we, is an outcome of the NDIS Commission's investigation, isn't no, it? No, there is no outcome of our, um, of our investigation as yet. The matter is under consideration. The, the, the NDIA, we referred, um, both the NDIA and the Commission had concerns about the, um, the issues that were reported by the ABC. Um, we've been engaging with the NDIA uh, to, for them to, to advise us about whether or not there are any issues in the billing patterns of a fort, and whether things that have been claimed by a fort or paid by the agency to a fort against people's plans uh, were appropriate to be paid. The NDIA makes that ass assessment. The Commission does not. Um, however, what the Commission is interested in is 
if there are irregularities in billing patterns that the NDIA assesses and confirms, um, that they will then advise us of uh, what, um, from their engagement with the provider, led to those irregularities. And the yeah, Commission... Oh, just pausing there. Paragraphs 31 through really until paragraph 65, oh, paragraph 60, I'm sorry, all relate to um, NDIS Commission's investigations. It's the NDIS Commission that's undertaking the investigations, and then the NDIA is contacted, paragraphs actually 59 and following, and then the NDIA, in effect, takes over and says, we want some money, please. So the NDIA appears from your own chronology to be acting on the investigations and the outcome of the investigations by the NDIS Commission. I don't think that's an accurate representation. Well, that's what um, your document says. Well, yeah, um, Chair, with respect, you asked me about what a, a dead outcome notice was and what was owing to both the agency and the Commission. Of that was the previous to... question. I've asked a different one now. Okay. Um, sorry about that. If um, you wouldn't mind. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, understand the question. proposition that really this is the NDIA that's pursuing the money, and in no doubt in a technical sense that's true. But the NDIA appears from your own account to have come into it by reason of the NDIS Commission's investigation. Yes, that, that, that is, that's as I was saying, that the, the NDIA and the NDIS Commission work on these matters together. We both have concerns. We do point out things to the NDIA as they do to us, which enables us both to um, act on our respective areas of interest. Our so you, you, so the this... NDIS Commission has pointed out to the NDIA that there seems to be a problem and that it may be that uh, a forward owes the NDIA money because of the matters that have been uncovered in the course of NDIS's commission. Is that an accurate way of putting it? Uh, uh, Chair, no, I don't believe that is an accurate way of putting it. We would not approach the agency with an interest about whether or not a provider owed the NDIA money or not. We would seek um, the NDIA's assistance to understand whether or not there were any irregularities in the way in which uh, uh, a um, provider was billing. And the reason we would ask um, the NDIA to consider those matters is so we could determine whether or not um, things such as uh, integrity, transparency, uh, as articulated under the code of conduct. All right, um, Just, all right. What then was the NDIS commission investigator doing? Well, if it wasn't that. He's been engaging with the NDIA as mm. they have gone through their assessment, as well as looking at a raft of other information uh, about this particular matter that we obtained from the board that's set out in my statement, um, as well as a number of other uh, connecting issues to do with the other investigations that Mr. Fogarty just took me through. Yes, all right. Mr. Fogarty. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Taylor, still on this point, if if a referral, I'll call it a referral, was made to the NDIA or the NDIA compliance team came to your commission um, and said, oh, we're investigating uh, potential wrong, I'll use wrong payments made. Um, if it came back to you later and said, look, we were wrong, it's all fine. There were some things that we thought were irregular, but it's all fine. Um, as opposed to, in this case, as I understand it from your statement, that they have, they, NDIA, have identified to the Commission an amount of $110,593.62 as this debt outcome notice to afford to be paid to the NDIA. Um, and they also identify, and this is still, I think, in paragraph, this is in paragraph 61 of your statement, the NDIA identifies what it, un, what, what it was investigating and the irregularities were threefold, it seems. Additional hours were claimed above the hours supported in documentation. Secondly, supporting information did not adequately support payments. For example, a higher group or support ratio was claimed than what was agreed to in the service agreement funded in the assistance plan. And thirdly, from the NDIA, 
No supporting information was provided to substantiate the services were provided as claimed. That notification from the NDA to the NDIS Commission, would, would it not have an effect on when it comes to review or suitability or re-registration in terms of code of conduct acting with integrity, honesty and transparency, or you couldn't make that call? Would it not have an effect? So the consequence, okay, the money doesn't go back to the NDIS Commission because it never came from them, but would there possibly be a, a consequence and perhaps the reason why the two entities talk to one another in this situation that the NDIS Commission might review this outcome and what the NDIA has informed it as to the irregular, irregularities when it comes to registration or re-registration. Is that the significance for the NDIS Commission? So I think they're separate considerations mm -hmm. um, because um, within the context of a, of a registration period, um, a provider can be subject to compliance and enforcement action by the Commission. And that can be any manner of things. We've got a compliance and enforcement um, policy, which I think has been provided to the Royal Commission in, in evidence previously. Yeah. But that sets out a number of um, different approaches that the Commission can take when non-compliance is um, identified. Uh, and each of those potential remedies, um, because remedy is our preference, um, I would have to say, is um, affords the organisation, um, for want of a pun, um, the uh, procedural fairness to respond to the issues that we've identified. Uh, but the the issues that that enable, I mean, well, the conditions of registration that a provider is subject to, provide us with um, the levers to take that compliance action, and that might be uh, a matter of the condition of registration to comply with the code, uh, but it also may be uh, matters of the conditions of registration around um, compliance with the practice standards. And these things might surface during a registration period uh, where we think the provider has moved away from conformity or more information has come available to us to inform our decision. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the third in this kind of example, because the provi provider is also bound by um, the uh, NDIA's um, conditions around um, claiming uh, whether or not it's, uh, they've met their obligation in complying with the laws of the Commonwealth or uh, in, in this case, the Commonwealth alone, but um, there might be other matters around state or territory laws. So all those things work together as part of an ongoing monitoring throughout a registration cycle. Uh, and that can lead to us taking compliance action, adding additional conditions on registration, for example, or if the provider is unable in that cycle of registration to remedy the matter. Um, and uh, we think that uh, you know, the outcome of that is that it does not meet um, particular standards or, um, or suitability is not um, able to be demonstrated, then um, the Commission can, depending on where in the cycle these matters arise, decide to revoke a registration um, or to refuse an application for registration if that is what is on hand. All right, thank you. It's quite comprehensive. But at this stage, this is an open investigation by the NDIS Commission into alleged misuse of NDIS funding. That's right. And, and an input into that investigation yeah. is the information that is provide that has been provided to us by the NDIA about um, the finding of irregularities in billing and um, and our consideration uh, once the information is made available from the NDIA about the reasons for that after yep. their engagement with the provider we will then so that'd be um, an integer in your how you how, how you we deal will with then that. treat and deal with those right. with All the right. provider. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, returning to the Thomas Stumpo uh, uh, incident, which uh, I note too is open. Um, and in respect of that, um, as, you un as you understand it, set out in short, um, Mr. Stumpo was a, was a client of a Ford, part of a short-term accommodation uh, respite. I'm, I'm looking at paragraph 68, I think it mm -hmm. begins and goes through yes. to 118. Um, on this occasion, he'd been essentially, he'd been sent home from the respite accommodation 
he'd been picked up, I think, by his mother, and it turned out that there was food stuck in his airway um, because he'd been fed solid food by the Ford staff prior to being picked up that day, later that day, by his mother, and that was contrary to his mealtime management plan, mm -hmm. which stipulated he couldn't eat solid food. Part of also the incident, do you agree, as, as, as you understand it, was that um, he appeared unwell, I think, when his mother came. She asked the staff about that and they suggested that it could perhaps be a virus. So That's as I understand. As you yes. understand it. All right. And then on arrival at home, his mother called an ambulance and they discovered that mm. there was the food lodged. Um, I think I asked you earlier that there'd been no notification of that as a reportable incident in 2019, June 2019, by a Ford, correct? No. But it did notify... In July 2021, just after the ABC story broke, is that right? Yes. Um, in your statement, at paragraph 76, you say that a Ford informed the NDIS Commission that they were unaware the incident was reportable. Yes. Um, and then they set out in their response or the notification to the NDIS Commission that HR had investigated the matter on 19 June 2019, had issued formal warning letters to the lifestyle assistant and the team leader involved in Mr Stompo's care that day. And then they also indicate that the letters included the following information. Firstly, that there was no nutritional swallowing plan on a Ford's client information management system, otherwise known as SIMS. Uh, the secondly, the team leader had not communicated the nutritional swallowing plan to staff. And thirdly, this is in the letter issued uh, to the two employees. Um, also, during the times the client, Mr Stumpo, visited Ford's respite, there were no community activities for him or others. They just stayed in the respite house. Now, again, according to your statement, the reportable incident team escalated that to the compliance team. I think shortly yeah. after it was received in July 2021, a notification. Um, just to, to be clear, and I emphasise it, it remains open, but you set out in paragraph 81 that the team's investigation has uncovered possible, and I stress possible, breaches of the NDIS Act as follows. Uh, firstly, the NDIS practice standards regarding risk management and support planning. It's a possible breach from... Yes. what I've just described, you agree? Secondly, the require, requirement to notify the NDIS Commission of a reportable incident. Uh, and then lastly, the NDIS Code of Conduct regarding the requirement to provide supports and services in a safe and competent manner with care and skill. Both the first and third of those matters are front and square the sorts of matters that are assessed in a quality audit, correct? because they're parts of the practice standards and parts of the code of conduct? They are at the point of in time, in time. that that, yeah, yeah. Um, that assessment's undertaken. Um, in uh, the code sorry. is not, um, sorry. The um, code of conduct. So the, the, the thing that the, that the quality orders look to are the practice standards that are relevant and the, um, and the indicators that support those standards. Okay, and, and the quality auditing guidelines, I think, in a sense, a circumference point, aren't they? That's another document that assists the, in... Um, the quality audit guidelines are, are, are as advertised. They, they set out the guidelines for quality auditors in undertaking the audit. All right. And that's issued by the Commission? Yes, yeah. they are Commissioner's guidelines. Um, in September 2021, a Section 26 letter was sent to a Ford by the NDIS Commission. What is a Section 26 letter? Um, that's a provision... Um, under the reportable incidents, incident management and reportable incidents rules. Um, and that section require, um, enables the commission to ask a provider um, certain things to do, to do in oh. response to an incident. In this case, um, the letter, you agree, asked or required of a Ford to initiate an internal review of its incident management system to identify any incidents and the letter set out a period from 1 January 2021 to 31 August 2021. Yes. That may be reportable incidents and any incidents found to be reportable had to be reported within seven days. Secondly, to provide documentation on how a forward identify and report incidents. Uh, and then to provide 
a list of other forms of information. I won't walk through them all, but training logs regarding supports for uh, Mr. Stumpo. So these were quite specific to him. Corrective actions implemented after the incident to mitigate risks. Details of inc any incidents involving the client regarding choking on near misses since the date of the incident, et cetera. The a Ford in October in response to that letter informed the NDIS Commission that in the period, so in answer to the first part, in the period 1 January 20, 2021 to 31 August 2021, an eight month period, it had identified 5,722 incidents of which 267 were notified as portable incidents to the NDIS Commission, uh, 56 of which were notified late. Do you agree that's in paragraph 91 of your statement? Um, yes, that's in my statement. That's... Then in November 2021, the Commission asked to forward for more detail regarding the response it had provided, um, including around the identified incidents. And the reason being the NDIS Commission said it wanted to better understand the scale of seriousness of those incidents, given as I understand it, the, the num essentially the response from a forward in October had really just been the numbers. Do you agree? Yep. Uh, then in December 2021, a forward's client services project manager sought guidance from the NDIS Commission uh, it's a reportable incidents team regarding the definition of missed medication and you refer to that in paragraph 99 of your statement. Yes. Um, is this a fair summary that to that point afford or certainly what was expressed by the client services project manager had considered missed medication was only reportable if it was deliberately not administered? Oh, that's a, as I understand. Um, and in the same correspondence, the client services project manager indicated that there would be at least 1500 incidents in which medication that had been missed over the last six months and asked how to deal with them. Now, the previous six years, I think my statement refers to paragraph, paragraph 99. Ah, thank you, that's right, over the last six years and asked, asked how to deal with them. Is that correct? Yes, yep. Um, part of the role of the NDIS Commission, I think evidence you've provided evidence before is to assist with compliance where a provider is asking for that assistance, correct? That's absolutely so, right. So, so that request isn't out of the ordinary or something that the NDIS Commission couldn't assist with? No, it's a very regular thing for providers to seek guidance about um, whether or not an incident is reportable. Um, and our staff, um, we have extensive material uh, describing what is reportable and what is not. Um, sometimes, to be honest, that those issues might not be entirely clear. Uh, and uh, in this instance, you know, quite, the, the organisation quite rightly sought our guidance. Um, we've been engaging with them about things that um, they hadn't reported. So it um, seems apparent to me that they were taking some caution to make sure that they were um, reporting the right things. This is December 2021 last year, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, at that time, the Commission writes back a letter, uh, and you've, at paragraph 100, you've extracted part of that, mm -hmm. or there's a reference to it. There are some circumstances where mismedication may not be reportable. However, if a doctor prescribes medication and a Ford has responsibility to administer the medication and fails to do so, this could constitute neglect and, and therefore is reportable. Um, in other words, you agree it doesn't need to be deliberate at all. The missed by no, forward no, it could be neglectful could be to to forgetting. forget forget to provide right. a person with the medication. Yes. Uh, does it concern you that as at December twenty twenty one, a member of Affords, well, that that question and that guidance was being sought by this provider? Um, yes. All right. Yes, because missing medication is extremely important. Absolutely. And, um, and is a reportable incident, regardless of whether the missing of the medication was inadvertent or deliberate, because the consequences can be very severe for the participant. 
Um, that is that is correct, depending on the medication and its purpose. That is that is correct. That is um, correct. I was I'm concerned about this on two levels that that they were seeking guidance from us about um, not two three many levels um, seeking guidance from us at this at this point um, in 2021 that there had been um, a number of um, matters that had been not reported and. Um, and I've um, I've just formed the view that I, I I still don't think it's clear um, to me at least um, that there is clarity about what should or shouldn't be reported. Uh, and, and you've expressed that, and I'll I've take expressed you to that, that yeah. in a recent letter to um, Ms. Tui, the CEO, correct? Six yes, months. I have. Yeah. Right. Um, moving on sequentially, February twenty twenty two. I will withdraw that in December. So the same month. The NAS Commission responded and asked for to clarify the exact number of incidents of missed medication since 1 July 2018 when the NDS regime mm -hmm. was in place for it. The exact number of instances uh, missed that Afford had assessed as meeting the reportable incident threshold. And then lastly, the number of participants that the identified reportable incident missed medication instances relate to. And in February of this year, this is paragraph 104 of your statement. Mm -hmm. uh, Ford's chief operating officer answered the request. Uh, and in terms of missed medication instances since 1 July 2018, so approximately three and a half years, day programs, so I broke it down into day programs, or day did, I should say, uh, 225 identified, then group home and respite 744. So in total 969, then the letter then identifies all of those uh, as being reportable incidents that should be reported. And then data is given or response is given in terms of the number of participants affected and in total over day programs and it's group home and respite 212. You agree with those figures? Yes. That's that's they're from this is February, 2022. You refer to a meeting on the 30th of March between the NDS Commission and Afford, including um, the two of the CEO. Uh, this is, I think, in the following. Yes. Following paragraphs. You didn't attend that meeting. No, I didn't. You say in your statement it was to discuss a range of issues and Afford outlined its operational and governance review, its reforms and changes taking place and intended, and it agreed to provide the NDS Commission with its business improvement plan once approved by the board. Um, also, your statement says that it was agreed that there would be scheduled ongoing three monthly meetings. Yeah, that, that's what I understand was agreed at that meeting. Um, are you aware of where the one's coming up? I couldn't tell you if it was oh, scheduled. Oh. I presume that, that that will happen as agreed. But are you, have you, are you, we, would you be part of that in your role or not? Are you part of that, I should say? No, I'm not part of that. Okay. Um, that I would leave that to the branch head who's right. overseeing that. Okay. Um, I've offered separately to meet with the CEO of Ford about my concerns and what form um, compliance action might take and to discuss that with you. Um, to your knowledge, the NDIS Commission requested that meeting with the four, or was it the other way around? No, I think we requested yeah. that meeting. Yeah. I don't I think it's in fairness, Arthur. Wrong, but I don't think your statement makes that clear. I might need to confirm that for you. All right. Um, to your understanding, though, was this the this was the very first time the NDIS Commission had met with any afford officer? Face to face about any of the investigations and compliance matters being conducted by it about a fraud. I can't answer that. Okay. Um, I mean, I'd have to presume that given most of our investigations have occurred through the period of the pandemic, that um, that there haven't been too many face to face right. um, well, engagements. Well. But um, I couldn't I couldn't tell you whether or not some of the engagements that are set out in my statement happen face to face with officers. Um, of course, there have been various interviews um, and other things undertaken as part of our investigations. Um, but you haven't been involved in any any meetings face-to-face -face or Zoom or otherwise with no. the executive of, senior executive of Afford in respect of any of these matters I've been referring no. to? Uh, and just to clarify, forgive me, I can't remember the period, 
I think you do sit out in, the st in your statement, you were acting NDIS commissioner between what dates? Um, from the 1st of July um, 2021 till the 9th of January 2022. All right. Um, in November 2021, you refer to this at paragraph 117 that the NDIS Commission introduced a new practice standard and quality indicator for mealtime management. Yes. Uh, and that's commenced on the 13th of December 2021. Um, what do you understand what practical effect that would have on service providers like a Ford? Is it now a, a new compliance or a new registration? compliance um, step that they must show their meeting? Yes. Um, so this, this new standard, um, together with the emergency um, standard, were introduced around the same time. The mealtime um, standard, oh, and, a, and a, also um, an addition to the high intensity... Um, I completely have a blank um, yeah, high intensity right. daily personal activity um, suite of standards around dysphagia. 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 So there were, there were a um, number. So of, there were a number of things so. though the, those mealtime supports came up as a um, as a significant contributor to avoidable deaths in the scoping review that the Commission um, undertook in 2019. Julian Troller did that piece of work for us. It's available on our website. And I think um, the former commission has given evidence to the Royal Commission about it. Um, and mealtime supports is, a, as I say, a significant contributor um, based on uh, the evidence that, um, that um, Professor Troller reviewed from um, the extensive experience of other jurisdictions prior to our commencement. Mm. And indeed, we have seen that um, meal time support issues are, are, are significant numbers in our reportable incidents scheme. This standard is to give uh, unequivocal instruction, if you like, through a standard about what each participant requiring meal time supports from, a, from any provider would expect and the mm. indicators provide um, the um, the guidance, uh, along with a whole range of other materials that we've given uh, to the sector and um, continue to roll out about um, how to deliver meal time supports in a in a safe manner, particularly with for people with more complex um, support needs. Um, and would you say, given that what what you know, and I, I, I accept that it remains open, but Tom, does Thomas Stumpo? matter and indeed in paragraph 24 at least one of the incidents mm. of those nine we discussed earlier in fact two when I, now that I look at it involve issues around choking and meal time that appears to be something that has been an issue for at least an alleged issue for they are Ford. they are terrible examples of why this is a significant issue in, yes. in this sector uh, Chair, I note the time. Regrettably, I, I'm not through the course of questions I'd like to ask Ms Taylor. Should we continue tomorrow? Uh, if that's possible with Ms Taylor. Is that possible, Ms Taylor? I can, I can make myself available. Yes. Thank you. We appreciate that. I think grateful. that should be done. I think there are a number of issues that emerge from uh, the statement. Um, not to the discredit of Ms. Taylor, but information that I think needs to be pursued. So we will do that. Um, so we will resume with Ms. Taylor tomorrow at 10. And uh, we, is there anything else we need to do now before adjourning? I don't, I don't think so, Chair. All right, well then arrangements can be made, uh, I'm sure with the other witnesses who are to appear tomorrow, so yes. they know what uh, is likely to transpire as far as timing is concerned. Yes, Chair, I understand a reading of, uh, of Rachel's statement was the first thing, and then Mr. Adamson is the only witness otherwise proposed tomorrow, so we can make those arrangements. In practice. Very good, all right, we'll adjourn now until 10 a.m. tomorrow. The Royal Commission is adjourned.